Gradually. It's exactly what we've seen with Port Talbot. You know, you can't just go in and say, you're not going to do it anyway anymore this way. You're You've got to do it this way instead. The steel thing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You've got to do it this way instead. You know, I, lots of farmers are on board with protecting the planet, but they, they can't do it overnight. You've got right. to give them time. Yeah. Yeah. So they're protesting, you know, they're saying no farmers, no food. When well, you say you any support some of these environmental protests, you're not one of these closet supporters <laughs> just up oil, are you? <laughs> Closet supporter. I think You're I've been. I think I've supporter. been quite open about just oh, oil. No. I don't like all their methods, but I do like the like message. Any of them. But I do appreciate I like the message. Any of them. Yeah, but sometimes but you've got to asking, do difficult Nikki, things. What they're asking for now, those protesters are unrealistic. What these protesters are asking for is not unrealistic. No. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Good afternoon and a very happy Friday to you. It's 3 p.m. and welcome to the Martin Daubney Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Today, after Wednesday's protests outside Parliament, I'll discuss Suella Braverman's claim that Islamists are now in charge of Britain. And on the same night, pro-Palestine messages were beamed onto the Elizabeth Tower, of course, Big Ben. I ask a legal expert why the police did nothing and shamefully allowed those images to be projected around the world. Plus, we've got a new line from Downing Street on that. Moving on, there's reaction to the news that Shamima Begum has lost her latest battle to get her British citizen back. Should we care? And... There's finally some good news for millions of people who are struggling to pay their energy bills, and that's all coming up in your next hour. Welcome to the show. It's always a pleasure to have your company. What a dramatic week in politics it's been, and now it moves on a pace. Those images I took of that projector putting those anti-Semitic messages onto Big Ben in the week, number 10 has dramatically come out in the last hour. We'll have an exclusive line on that. Finally, it seems some common sense is prevailing. And I'm asking the big question today, is the mob... Winning from grooming gangs, Batley Grammar School, the Trojan horse scandal, the murder of David Amos, the rise in anti-Semitism since October 7th, weekly marches, and now the mob making sure Parliament is forced into voting. I'm asking the big question. Are the Islamists taking over? Please get in touch. All the usual ways, GB views at gbnews.com. We've got one heck of a show coming up. But before that, it's time for your latest news headlines with Tatiana Sanchez. Martin, thank you very much. We start this bulletin with some breaking news. The former chief executive of the post office, Paula Venels, has been stripped of her CBE following the post office scandal. Venels, who received the award in 2019, has faced a backlash following the wrongful prosecution of hundreds of post office staff. She's expected to be formally stripped of her CBE by the king for bringing the honour system into disrepute. We'll bring you more on this story as we get it. ISIS bride Shamima Begum has lost an appeal over the removal of her British citizenship. The now 24-year-old was a teenager when she left the UK to travel to Syria and joined the so-called Islamic State. Her citizenship was later revoked on national security grounds. Begum's solicitor Daniel Ferner has promised to continue fighting until she's safely back home. We are going to keep fighting. I, I, I want to say that I'm, I'm sorry to Shamima and to her family that after five years of fighting, she still hasn't received justice in the British court. And to promise her and to promise the government that we're not going to stop fighting. Britain has signed a new deal with the EU's border agency in a further bid to stop the small boat crossings. The agreement with Frontex will see UK Border Force cooperate more closely with its European counterparts on intelligence and training. 1,716 people have been intercepted crossing the channel illegally so far this year. 
James Cleverly says the deal will help tackle the problem. It means we can share information quicker, share intelligence quicker, we can operate more effectively. And the reason that's important is because the EU wants to secure its external borders just as we do. So people who are coming into Europe from uh, Eastern Europe, across the Mediterranean, the European Union wants to stop them. We want to help them stop them because those people filter through Europe and ultimately find themselves on small boats coming across to the UK. The Prime Minister says it's unacceptable for intimidation to threaten democracy. His comments come as the common speaker faces growing pressure to resign over the Gaza ceasefire debate. Sir Lindsay Hoyle says a decision to allow an amendment was motivated by concern for MP safety. Rishi Sunak says he expects police to use new powers to clamp down on protests around Parliament, constituency offices and council chambers. I think MP safety is incredibly important and it's right that in our society democracy needs to be able to function smoothly, people need to be able to raise their views and debate things without the fear of being intimidated or indeed attacked and that's why we're giving the police more powers to clamp down on protests. It's simply unacceptable. Households will see their energy bills fall to the lowest level in two years. Energy regulator Ofgem has announced it's dropping the price cap by 12.3% in response to wholesale prices effective from April. It means the typical energy bill will fall by £238 to £1,690. Serial child killer Lucy Letby's bid to appeal her convictions will be heard by a court in April. The former nurse was sentenced to 14 whole life orders after she murdered seven babies and attempted to kill six others at a hospital between June 2015 and 2016. If judges rule against her, it'll be the end of Letby's appeal process. The biggest ever drug bust has been made by UK authorities in a major blow to drug cartels. 5.7 tonnes of cocaine, with a street value of more than £450 million, was found in a container at Southampton Port, which was transporting bananas from South America. National Crime Agency officers believe the haul was heading to Hamburg, but they say a significant proportion of the drug would have ended up back in the UK. Now, thousands of residents have been evacuated from their homes in Plymouth, where a World War II bomb was found. The 500-kilogram unexploded device was found in a garden on Tuesday morning in the Keyham area. The Ministry of Defence says the operation to remove it safely has led to one of the largest peacetime evacuations since the Second World War. The bomb's being moved through the city for disposal at sea. Residents living within 300 metres of the convoy route have been told to leave the area until 5 o'clock this evening. And Coronation Street actor John Savadon, best known for playing butcher Fred Elliott, has died at the age of 86. Confirming his death, his agent said he'll be sorely missed by all who knew him. He arrived on the cobbles in 1994 and became a fan favourite. His storylines involved his disastrous love life, including three marriages and several failed proposals. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now back to Martin. We've got so much to do today, I don't know where to start. I'm literally overexcited, but let's get stuck in. And we start with comments from the former Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, as she said that Islamists are now in charge of Britain. Mrs Bradman made that claim just a couple of days after those infamous protests outside Westminster. And if you recall, on Wednesday night, a number of messages, including the words from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, were projected onto the Elizabeth Tower, which, of course, is the home to Big Ben, the bell. Swella Bradman wrote in the Daily Telegraph this morning, the truth is that the Islamists, the extremists and the anti-Semites are in charge now. They have bullied the Labour Party, they have bullied our institutions, and now they have bullied our country into submission. Extraordinary words with huge importance. And I'm joined in now in the studio to discuss all this with our political editor, Christopher Hope. Chris, shall we start 
with a, a line that you just got out of number 10 today, and they appear to be backing GB News on the Big Ben situation. Yeah, the Big Ben situation is, is that, that, they, that expression from the river to the sea, and it goes on, Palestine should be free, is chanted by pro palestinian protesters about Israel. Israel should be swept away. Uh, and, and it's a challenge to the state of Israel. It's deeply offensive to Israel, clearly, and to Jews living in this country. The police didn't step in. Now, you filmed it on your, mm. your camera out there. Yeah. You actually found the projector, didn't you? And you, you, saw, you, you said, why aren't the police stepping in and dealing with this? And you see on the screen now the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the message down on the Elizabeth Tower uh, holding the Big Ben bell. Yeah. But you, you found the projector. It wasn't being challenged by the police. Should the police have stepped in? Number 10 was asked that today. The PM's deputy uh, official spokesman, who speaks for the PM, so it's, these are the words that Mr Sunak would have used were he being asked. He said there's a distinction between operational policing and not, but they were making very clear that in their, in their view um, it was wrong that, that these words were projected onto, onto Parliament. So yeah. they're making very clear your feeling of outrage, Martin, that you were expressing so um, eloquently yesterday yeah. and from the filming on Wednesday evening after the show has been echoed by Number 10. But they're not going as far as saying... Operation, the police should step in. That's one for them. Yeah, and it made the front page of today's Daily Express. And I don't know if we've got that imagery, we can show in where I managed to locate this projector just opposite um, the green, opposite um, Big Ben. Mm. You can see it there. there I, walk, it I walk straight up to it, and you can see it's, it's, there. A, it's a small device just lashed onto I mean, the, the railings. The police could throw a towel over that, or they, they could, could grab it, they could unplug it, yeah. take it away. That is, you know, you, 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 the law is you can't do this. Yeah, so I. I'll be honest, I wanted to kick that thing and smash it. You um, can't do that, Martin. No, I didn't. I filmed it and I got the evidence and I literally went back over the green, Chris, and I showed it to officers by Parliament. I said, look, and I pointed out, there it is, there's a project. You can see the, the beam of light. I said, go and nick them. They deserve to be taken off the streets. They are shaming Britain. They are shaming the world. This has been beamed around the world. And I said, do you know this is an offence? And he said, yes, we do. One of our colleagues will deal with it. Chris, they didn't deal with it. Mm. It was there for well over an hour. People are outraged and now number 10 agree. Well, they agreed that it was wrong to display the message on Parliament. They are not going to get there and step in and say what the police should operationally. And it were a policeman here, they might say, look, it was a tense situation. They're trying to stop any kind of trouble breaking out. They didn't want to make it worse by stopping words on there. But, that would, but the, you know, the Jewish community would say, how can the Mother of Parliament have those, that language projected on, onto it mm. and police do nothing? And, Chris, we've got so much more to talk about. We'll have to leave it to the next hour now. We'll talk about Suella Bravman's astonishing words today about the Islamists. And the Speaker, don't forget, 69 MPs now say he should go. If that gets towards 100 by Monday, he's in real trouble. And at 5 o'clock, we've got Lee Anderson on the show. He's one of the 69 mm. Just Stop Hoyles. We'll ask him why he signed that. But let's move on. I'm joined now by Kevin Hurley, who's the former head of counter-terrorism at City of London Police. Thank you for joining us on the show, Kevin. Always a pleasure. Can we start with this furore over this projector, putting those images onto Big Ben? And now, uh, as, I, as you may have heard, I was there the other night. I showed the police the projector. I said, why aren't you going to take this down? They st stood aside and didn't do anything whatsoever. It was there for well over one hour. And it's made the front pages of newspapers, it's been beamed around the world, and now number 10 is saying it should have been removed. Can I ask you, why didn't the police step in and do anything at the time? Well, I'd, I'd say almost certainly it's because the individual gold command or bronze, bronze commander, as they would call him, or her, the person on the ground, probably a chief inspector, possibly a superintendent, either wasn't aware or decided in the interests of preserving tranquility decided not to do it. I think they're taking the wrong uh, position. Police generally, with many, many demonstrations of all sorts going on in the country, there is a case for police being far more robust in the face of anti-Semitic uh, behaviour, which this is a clear example of, or people preaching hatred or violence against anyone of whatever creed. I think we're just seeing a symptom of what's gone wrong with the police in terms mm. of the leadership feeling it's not appropriate for them to, quite frankly, get stuck in. I can understand why that is, because the police, police feel, if you like, bedeviled on all sides and feel that perhaps they don't have the political or the media support. And, of course, whatever they do is captured on the cameras and they're vilified at every turn. I look at some of the headlines I see in, in newspapers and think, well, what do you think you're doing? All you're doing is mm. destroying the morale of the police and we'll all suffer for it. So in short, yes, of course, 
the police should have stopped that. It was clearly an anti-Semitic uh, statement, very offensive to probably millions of people up and down the UK. But it comes down to why didn't the boss on the ground, her or him, decide to deal with that? Uh, and I just think we are, we have ended up with so many senior police officers who are quite timid in taking action. Very often they're, they're officers, they're constrained. Once they're mm. in a large group, deployed as a group of police support unit, as they call it, they have to work under the authority of the bosses who are there, their inspectors, chief inspectors. And it's disappointing to see yet again what I think is a lack of decisive leadership where the, the pet phrase will be trolled out, oh, we did it in the interests of preserving tranquility. Well, Kev, I'll tell you, I we was We are there. losing the streets. I'm telling you, we're losing the streets in London. Well, I wonder if the word losing is appropriate, or actually, is it lost? Because I was there the other night, and I was specifically pointing out to individual officers on that beat, that guy's wearing a full face mask. That guy's wearing a full face mask. Laws were passed on February the 8th, a £1,000 spot fines, a month in jail. You have the right to go and ask him to remove it. The police looked absolutely befuddled and confused and utterly disinterested, Kevin. And so we have this conversation yep. once again of two-tier yep. policing. You kind of feel, yep. Kev, that they're happy to stand around and not have any arrests to keep the count down, to make it look like mostly peaceful, that dreaded phrase. Whereas, at Armistice Day, when veterans and patriots went in, they donned the riot gear and they steamed in. Kevin, it feels like we've not only losing the streets, we've lost them. Well, I think it comes down again to what I'm saying about leadership. If there's poor briefing and poor direction at the beginning, which is we will not tolerate any displays of hate, anti-Semitic uh, behaviour in this particular case. We will not allow face masks to be worn and we will start to make arrests. That's the issue. And of course, the other point is the people above, if you like, maybe the 100 or so cops who were deployed that day, did the su chief superintendent, the commander public order, did they make sure they had enough assets parked up around the corner to deal with stuff when the problem occurs? I always believe that you, should, if need be, you need two or 300, 400 around the corner, load of mounted police around the corner, so that when you decide to enforce the law, you win. And that what's going on is all too often it's inadequately resourced. Of course, there's a knock-on effect here. But when you pull people into central London for that, you denude the streets of the local areas of where the police are, which opens up the other argument, is have the police been cut too much in the past? And indeed, given the demographics of the country, the way it's changing, and the non-compliance of large groups of people who live in the UK mm. now, perhaps the police numbers should be increased. I mean, for a similar size population, France has got more than double the number of police officers that we have in the UK. Well, we've got one of the smallest numbers relative to most European countries. Uh, okay. So, you know, I despair sometimes, but bottom line, it's leadership and probably more investment needed to increase the numbers of police officers uh, out there. <sighs> OK, Kev, loads more we could talk about, but we have to leave it there simply because of time. Is it the numbers? Is it the gear around the corner? There were lots and lots of riot vans there, but let me tell you this. There was no strong response to that crowd as there was on Armistice Day. It felt like a completely and utterly different response to two different crowds. When you police without fear or favour, that is a thin end of anarchy. Now, we will, of course, have lots more on this story throughout the show. And at 10 past four, I get the views of Nigel Farage. And later this hour, I'll be joined by a legal expert, Stephen Barrett, to find out precisely why the Metropolitan Police didn't arrest anyone over those pro-Palestine messages that were beamed onto the Elizabeth Tower on Wednesday. And there's loads of coverage on our website, gbnews.com. And you've helped to make it the fastest-growing national news website in the country. So thank you very much. Now, we've got a GB News exclusive for you now. And last week, Labour withdrew its support for the party's candidate for the Rochdale by-election after he made anti-Semitic remarks at a meeting. Of course, Azir Ali was suspended from the Labour Party, but perhaps not as disowned as we might expect. And to discuss this, I'm now joined by GB News political, Deputy Political Editor Tom Harwood, who has this exclusive story. What's the latest, Tom? 
Well, Azir Ali, of course, at the start of last week, was disowned as the Labour Party's candidate in Rochdale. This after it was revealed he had... Uh, concocted and promoted a conspiracy theory about October the 7th, saying that Israel allowed the slaughter of its own civilians, uh, and indeed after he blamed uh, on recording uh, Jewish quarters, certain Jewish quarters in the media for uh, reports against a, a pro-Palestinian MP. Well, he was uh, removed as the Labour Party candidate, disassociated and suspended from the Labour Party. But today, he is... Uh, I, I have obtained a picture of... Uh, Azar Ali lunching with Labour Party figures. Indeed, the lady next to him there is the candidate, the Labour Party candidate for Blackpool North and Fleetwood. That's Lorraine Beavers. But this is a table of Labour Party councillors at the Lancashire County Council budget meeting this lunchtime. So that's Azar Ali, who has been suspended from the Labour Party, lunching with Labour Party, well, former colleagues. Uh, and this will raise some questions in terms of how suspended Azar Ali is. Of course, his name still is on the ballot paper. The Labour Party aren't officially campaigning for him. But there's every chance that he could still win that by-election. His name is written next to the Labour Party logo on that ballot paper. And if he does win, there'll be questions as to whether or not he joins the Labour Party grouping in Parliament. And this picture today might suggest that's what he's minded to do. That's a superb exclusive. Azir Ali lunching with Labour. Tom Hole, great stuff, and certainly food for thought. Now, joining me now is... No, we've done that bit. Move on. We have to go through the candidate standing in the Rochdale by-election, of course. Now, it's Azir Ali. Labour, though, the party has withdrawn its support for him, of course, as discussed. Mark Coleman, independent. Simon Danjuk, Reform UK. Ian Donaldson, Liberal Democrat. Paul Ellison, Conservative. George Galloway, Workers' Party of Britain. Michael Howarth, Independent. William Howarth, also Independent. Guy Otten, the Green Party. Raven Rodent Subortino, official monster Raving Looney. And David Tully, finally Independent. Now, there's less than two hours for you to give yourself the chance to win 18 grand in cold, hard cash in our latest Great British Giveaway as lines close soon at just 5pm. So make sure you get your entry in and here's how you could win that Wonga. Make sure you don't miss your chance to win £18,000 in cash to spend however you like as lines close at 5pm today. My name's Phil Cox. I'm from Leeds and I won the Great British Giveaway. I won £10,000 cash, a new phone and £500 worth of gift vouchers. So we're planning to get married next year. So it's been a, a nice time to get the money because it, most of it's going to go towards the wedding. I'd say, why not? What, what is it? The price of a text and £2 to enter. And if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win £18,000 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB02, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm today. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Good luck. Great stuff now. There's good news at last for millions of households that are struggling to pay their gas and electric bills. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. The Camilla Tomini Show, Sunday mornings from 9.30. Yeah, I appreciate the story it isn't in today's papers, but it has been running all week. And it's yes. this row over um, the use of nitrogen hypoxia to kill this man who was on death row in... Um, Alabama. Alabama, yeah. And it's been linked back to you, and I wanted to ask you about it, because this is intriguing, because you did a television show back in 2015 where you, I believe, tested this method 
of execution. Just tell me briefly about it, Michael. What happened? I didn't test this method of execution, and it was a bit longer ago than that. But what I did do was test hypoxia. So for I, I tested various ways in which people uh, are killed in the United States and, and asked the question as to whether there was a hum more humane way of doing it. So I was put into hypoxic situations, for example, into a chamber run by the Netherlands Air Force, which simulated what happens if you're in an aircraft at 30,000 feet and suddenly the windows blow out. And what happened to me was that I was almost instantly rendered incapable. Uh, as an experiment, I was trying to play with children's toys, putting triangle shapes into triangle spaces, and I, I was quickly unable to do that. I was asked, what is 9 minus 5? And I said, 5. Mm -hmm. And then the, um, the officer who was with me, the uh, Air Force officer, who was wearing an oxygen mask, said to me, Michael, put your mask on or you will die. And I was incapable of putting my own mask on. Now, this suggested that hypoxia was very fast acting yeah. and that you had, obviously I was in no pain or anything no. like that, I was just completely unaware. By the way, this is why if you're on an aircraft and, and it depressurizes, you must put your own mask on first. But so of course, I can't, I can't go on and draw conclusions. No. We, we did not experiment with nitrogen. But what I can say is it was, it was evident to me that hypoxia renders you incapable almost instantaneously. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 3.25. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, later this hour, I'll be joined by the man hoping to replace Andy Burnham as the mayor of Greater Manchester. And I'll ask him, what's the point of mayors? But before that, let's find some good news for the millions of people who are struggling to pay their energy bills. And the average household bill will fall to its lowest point in two years from April after Ofgem finally lowered its price cap. Well, here to give us all the details is our economics and business editor, Liam Halligan, with On The Money. Liam, it's always a pleasure to have you in the studio. At last, the sun comes through the clouds. Some, <laughs> good, some good news for British households at long last and feeling the pain of bills for way too long. It is good news, but we have to put this in context. That's what I'm here to do, right? To yeah. tell you about the real details behind the glib headlines <laughs> that we hear exclusively from other broadcasters, <laughs> but not here on GB News. So let's just recap some of what you said there, Martin. This, this is the off-gem energy price cap. Mm. They're the energy regulator. This is the cap on the average household's average bill, given average usage yeah. for combined gas and electricity. So it doesn't mean you won't pay more for your electricity if you use more electricity. It means the average use household, mm. their bill will fall. And the book bill falls from £1,928 a year equivalent to £1,690. That's from April the 1st. And that's a drop of about 12%. Well, that's equivalent to about 20 quid a month. So three or four pints in a pub, depending on where you live. Maybe yeah. four or five pints, five or six pints in some better priced parts of the UK. That cap, though, it's still 50% higher than it was before Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022, so two years ago, pretty much to the day. That's what we're comparing it to. Electricity prices, gas prices in this country are still very, very high. And on top of that, the energy providers, they've managed to wrestle a special uh, permission out of Ofcom that they can charge us £2.33 each a month, on average, per yeah. household to address their so-called debt backlog, the debt backlog that they claim is the debt backlog of customers, right? So where the customers allow electricity companies money. I must say, yeah. Martin, when I talk to 
friends and family in the local pub and so on. I hear a lot more stories about electricity companies owing customers money. They've yeah. got two grand of my money and they won't give it back to me and I've phoned them a hundred times and spent 20 minutes on hold every time, rather than electricity companies subbing customers. Mm. So maybe my anecdotal evidence is wrong. I'm prepared to accept that it is. But I haven't seen data on that that I can find anywhere and I've looked. But it does strike me as a bit odd that without any kind of debate and uh, completely blindsiding us, Ofgem has agreed to allow electricity companies to charge all of us more in order to try and tackle a debt backlog which they claim is with customers rather than with the energy providers themselves. Are we looking at a satisfying long-term downward chug, as we're hoping, with interest rates, or as you keep pointing out, Liam, um, precarious world events such as the Middle East could, could, could put a wrecking ball through the good news anyway? Well, you'll remember as a student of politics, Martin, roughly the same vintage as me. <laughs> I mean, we followed American politics closely in the 90s, yeah. didn't we? Because it was so exciting with mm. Clinton and Bush 1 and Bush 2 and... Crikey, off the back of Reagan, we're about to go into another very interesting period in American yes. politics, shall we say. But there was that phrase from the 1990s, Bill Clinton's economic advisor, James Carville, who said to his campaign staff, it's the economy, stupid, just mm. keep talking about the economy because that's what people mm. really care about. Well, it is the economy, stupid, in this coming election, this autumn, when it's expected, but it's also the geopolitics, stupid. It yeah. is Russia, Ukraine. It is Palestine, uh, Israel. It is, you know, China, Taiwan. It is tensions in the Pacific. It is, can container ships get through the Suez Canal or are those container mm. ships going to keep being taken out by Iranian-backed Houthi rebels mm. who have been down to, you know, their local department store in London and, and, and sent drones to their cousins uh, on the Horn of Africa uh, <laughs> and in Yemen, as it were. So this geopolitics, world events will determine wholesale prices of gas. Now, the reason these, this off-gem energy price cap has come down now is because we've had two successive relatively mild winters in Europe. Yeah. So gas usage has been relatively low since Russia invaded Ukraine, which is just historically advantageous for energy importers like the UK. Uh, another reason is because we've had loads of uh, liquefied natural gas exported from America to Europe. America's become the largest exporter of liquefied natural gas in the world in the last couple of years, even overtaking Qatar and the other Middle Eastern mm -hmm. gas exporting giants, not least because the war in Ukraine has meant that Western Europe has wanted to wean itself off Russian gas. If that pattern continues, if wholesale gas prices continue to stay relatively benign. They're still a lot higher than they were before Russia Ukra invaded Ukraine. And they've come down a lot more, by the way, than this off-gem energy price cap mm -hmm. has come down. But if the relatively benign picture on global financial markets, particularly wholesale gas prices, we get 40% of our electricity from gas-fired power stations, the gas fire... The, the gas price, the spot price of gas determines the spot price of electricity in this country. Um, and so a lot of it depends on geopolitics, the price of gas, whether or not this time next year there'll be a further reduction in the off-gem energy price cap. There might be, but there might not be. Liam Halligan, as ever, expert analysis always on the money. Thank you very much for joining us and sharing your expertise. Now there's still lots more to come between now and six o'clock. Later in the show, I'll be joined by Lee Anderson, who's got a lot to say about this week's controversial events inside and outside Parliament, and he will tell us why he signed that petition to just stop Hoyle. But first, your latest news headlines with Ray Addison. Thanks, Martin. It's 3.32. Our top stories. Former Post Office Chief Executive Paula Venels has been stripped of her CBE following the Horizon IT scandal. Now, she faced a backlash following the wrongful prosecution of hundreds of sub-postmasters. She's expected to be formally stripped of her CBE by the King for bringing the honours system into disrepute. ISIS bride Shamima Begum has lost an appeal over the removal of her British citizenship. The now 24-year-old was a teenager when she left the UK to travel to Syria and joined the so-called Islamic State. Her citizenship was later revoked on national security grounds. Begum's solicitor has vowed to continue fighting until she's back home. 
Britain has signed a new deal with the EU's border agency in a further bid to stop small boat crossings. The agreement with Frontex will see UK border force co co cooperate rather more closely with its European counterparts on intelligence and training. 1,716 people have been intercepted crossing the channel so far this year. And thousands of residents have been evacuated from their homes in Plymouth after the discovery of a World War II bomb. The 500-kilogram unexploded device was found in a garden on Tuesday morning in the Kiam area. The Ministry of Defence says the operation to remove it safely has led to one of the largest peacetime evacuations since the Second World War. The bomb's being moved through the city for disposal at sea. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Let's take a look at the markets. The pound will buy you $1.2680 and €1.1722. Euros. Price of gold, £1,597.83. That's per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,703 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Ray. Now, Shamima Begum's lost her latest bid to challenge the removal of her British citizenship. When, she's going to get the, when is she going to get the message that we simply don't want her to come back? I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's news channel. Twenty twenty four, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In twenty twenty four, GB News is Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. Francis, just stop oil have in the past broken the law. I remember distinctly the uh, Dartford crossing. That ended up with two jailed, I believe, if I remember correctly. Is it ever justified in your view? Uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me on. I mean, I would, I would have to say yes. I mean, we're trying to preserve my life, your lives, the lives of your family. And it's not just the planet that we're trying to protect. It's the lives of, of millions of people. And, you know, we know from history that we have to break the law in order to, to put pressure on the government and to, to be listened to. No and one would doubt no your that. sincerity in your views. You genuinely believe in what you fight for. But there are others who think differently. For example, there are Islamist extremists who believe that people will go to hell unless they convert to Islam. They will sincerely, perhaps, break the law in order to force people to convert. In their view, they might be saving people's lives for eternity. There might be abortion activists who say that babies are being murdered and to save their lives, we need to break the law to stop people having abortions. Why do you get to say that your moral conviction is the one that's right and other people's individual moral conviction are those that are wrong? So what's really integral to the Just Stop Oil campaign is the fact that it is a non-violent campaign. That's what separates us from the examples that you've just given. We're absolutely dedicated non-violence, both as a tactic and as a principle. So though we might be breaking the law... If it... individuals take it upon themselves to break the law for whatever their course is, surely the way that we decide what society wants in general is democratic and within the law. Well, of course, we know also that protest is absolutely integral to maintaining and upholding a democracy, and in, in particular, non-violent protest. I mean, I really can't express to you how severe this situation is, and I'm sure you know this. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially 
yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Now, viewers on GB News can see live pictures from Plymouth on your screens now, and they're about to dispose of an unexploded Second World War bomb in the sea. The bomb was found in a garden on Tuesday, and we'll keep an eye on that. And when the bomb goes bang, we'll make sure to cut back to it. But moving on, on May the 2nd, the good people of Greater Manchester will vote for their mayor. Labour's Andy Burnham is trying to be re-elected, but now I'm joined by a man who wants to replace him, and that is Nick Buckley, who will stand as an independent candidate. Nick, welcome to the studio. We did a piece on Mayor Otters yesterday mm. on GB News, and what astonished me, this is for the East Midlands where I'm from, 26% of people don't even know there's a mayor in their region. A lot of people think it's a power grab, it's unnecessarily expensive, and their council bills don't get cheaper anyway. So my simple question to you, Nick, is what's the point of mayors? If you can find someone who's got the answer to that, I'd be interested to finding out the answer to that question because I don't know what the point of a mayor is. But you're standing as a mayor. I am, but not for the reason you probably think I am. I'm standing to be mayor to give the people of Greater Manchester an opportunity to get rid of the mayor. And if we get rid of the mayor, your council tax bill will come down because he adds money onto your council tax bill. Now, in Greater Manchester, a mayor was forced upon us a decade ago. By, again, the, why is it always the Tories? just don't understand democracy, forced upon us. The councils agreed to it because the councils were greedy and were promised more money. The people I'm speaking to for the last three, four years now are saying to me, Nick, don't want a mayor. I was mm. never asked did I want a mayor. It was imposed upon us. So am I voting for something I don't want? We've got a democracy hole now in Greater Manchester. I want to fill it by holding a referendum in Greater Manchester, going back to the people who should have been spoken to at the beginning and saying, do you want this position? If they vote no, I'll go to Westminster and we'll get that position removed. So you're a turkey voting for Christmas. You, yep. you're, you're a mayor who wants to get rid of being a mayor. I'm a mayor who just wants to improve my region and my country. And if that means the job I get voted into has to go to improve the country and improve my region, then so be it. And how much do mayors cost? And all, I mean, we see in London all the time a huge amount of staff that Sadiq Khan has got. And every time crime goes up or bills goes up, he blames Westminster anyway. And that is why we have mayors. The Tory government decided that they wanted to bat away problems from the big cities, which are normally run by Labour. So if we give him a mayor, Every time they complain about something, we can say to those people, you voted in your mayor, you need to go back to your mayor. I think it was a way to confuse the public, add an extra layer of bureaucracy and cost so the Tories could say, not our problem in the big cities. But it was meant to be about devolution. It was meant to be about local powers mm. for local people, cutting Westminster out of the decision-making. You're saying that, that was a false dawn? That, how it was sold to us. Now, if we had decent mayors, that might be the case. But what the mayor position attracts is failed politicians and people who want to climb the greasy pole of politics. So we've always got somebody, like the mayor at the moment um, in Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham. Andy Burnham wants to be prime minister. He's using Greater Manchester as a stepping stone to get into number 10, to fulfil his dream. It's a wonderful dream, by the way. Aspiration's wonderful. I don't blame him for that. But your aspiration should be built on the backs of the people of Greater Manchester. Mm. But he most likely will win the mayoralty in Manchester. Sadiq Khan will most likely win in London. So people are voting, but the turnout's pretty low at mayoral elections, is it, compared to generals? Absolutely. One in three people in Greater Manchester vote for the mayor. And that is the problem. So years ago, people would, if they didn't like a particular politician, would vote against them. What's happened last couple of decades is people now go, I'm not voting at all. Now, Nick, I want to talk to you about police and crime, because police and crime commissioner is, is one of the mayoral tiers, yes. de facto jobs. We're seeing an awful lot of aggro on British streets at the moment. You're from Manchester, you're in London. What would you do if you were in charge? Because it feels to me like we're losing the streets. 
We are losing the streets. I mean, we lost the streets to serious crime, you know, a decade ago. Greater Manchester, there's deaths in Greater Manchester now on the streets almost daily. It's not as bad as London yet, but we're catching up. We're really catching up. The Free Palestine marches are horrendous. We have smaller ones in Greater Manchester. If I'm the police crime commissioner, all that stops overnight. And the reason why I know it stops overnight is because I've trained police officers. I used to be based in police stations as a, as a council manager. I know how to fix the police. I don't want a police service anymore. I want a police force. Mm. I want police to hammer criminals. I want the police not to decide community relations, should I do this, shouldn't I do that? I want the police going, it's black and white. It's either against the law or it's not. Mm. If it's not, it's none of my concern. If it's against the law, I'm stopping it now. And cowardice is running through all our institutions, the police, our politics, Westminster around the corner, all that trouble we had yesterday in Parliament. Mm. It's all cowardice. All cowardice. If we can't elect people who will put the country ahead of them, ahead of their safety, ahead of their career, ahead of their personal convenience, that's why we're in this mess. Cowardice everywhere. Well, there's no cowardice from you. Nick Buckley, independent candidate for mayoralty in Greater Manchester. Superb stuff. And thanks for joining us in the studio in Westminster. Now, moving on in a few minutes, I'll have news of Shamima Begum's latest failure to regain her British citizenship. But first, in a GB News series, Innovation Britain, we're looking at the successes of British manufacturing around our great country. PP Control and Automation are an electrical control system builder. Now, they've had a record year. So, Tony, what's behind this growth? And also, why are you so integral to UK manufacturing? Uh, our business produced control and automation systems are gone to machinery. The machinery is used to make everything we buy, everything that we touch, everything that we see. So, our company supplying automation into companies that will make machines that could milk cows, that could cut metal, that could put labels on fruit, that could put meat in, in trays. So, everything that we do is really affecting that ability of people to want and buy things and how things happen. So why have you had such a successful year then? We're seeing the growth of automation across many sectors now. Not We need to invest in automation, as I said before, and there are skill shortages now that also exist. So certain processes that used to be done by people are now being done by machines. So what is it you as a company are doing then? We're investing ourselves, so although we talk about automation, we need to invest ourselves. We've spent over £2 million investing in automation for certain parts of our processes, and we're working with customers really to promote automation into new sectors. So then what is it that you're doing with regards to automation? Well, in addition to promoting automation to other industries, we're investing heavily in automation ourselves. So we've invested over £2 million in automation for cable manufacturing test. That's enabling us to scale and work with some really exciting companies in some really exciting new sectors such as uh, ESG, hydrogen and renewables and that's really important for us as a business, it's really important for those companies and ultimately it's helping us scale and grow ourselves so our own investment is helping us help those companies grow and develop. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Lee Anderson's Real World. Fridays from 7 p.m. Dr. Jane Jones, who's the clinical lead for Care After Combat. Yep. Jane, thanks for coming. And uh, just tell me a little bit about your organisation. What do you do? OK, well, thank you for having me here so we can talk about Care After Combat. So we are an organisation, a charity, who work into the prison system, working with military veterans who've somehow got involved with the justice system and... So there's, there's quite a high population of, of ex-service men and women in our prisons. Why is that, do you think? So 2014, the government did a review of who was resident in UK prisons and what they found were that military veterans are the highest occupational group. And this obviously raises some concerns. Yeah. So the government wanted to do something about that. And so they supported Care After Combat initially, just as a scoping exercise, really, to see if there was any way we could help these men and women at 
actually, you know, understand the problems that led to offending behaviour yeah. and go on to lead successful lives. So what sort of offending behaviour are we talking typically for, for people that's in prison that's actually served in our armed forces? Primarily it's uh, violence. Yeah. So that is the highest offence that, that we work with. Okay. But of course the military, as with everybody else, it's the full range of offending behaviour. Okay, so we're in a pub, Jane. Dr. Jane, uh, and I guess for some people, you know, the old tip of alcohol is good, uh, yeah. a bit of fun uh, of a weekend, relax, let your hair down. But for some people, alcohol is not always their best friend, and I guess that plays a, plays a part in some of your veterans that end up inside. Yeah. Absolutely. So, speaking from my own experience, a good two-thirds of the people I work with have some kind of mental health problem or mental health yeah. difficulty, struggling to either adapt into yep. civilian life or with some of the traumas they've experienced during service. People might self-medicate with alcohol to manage some of those thoughts and feelings. Yeah. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the Clown Show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 3.49. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, at 4 o'clock, Nigel Farage will join me to discuss Suella Braverman's claim that Islamists are in charge of Britain. But now I want to discuss that topic now as well and ask why the police didn't intervene when pro-Palestine messages were beamed onto the Elizabeth Tower, which of course is the home of Big Ben. And joining me now to discuss this is the barrister and writer Stephen Barrett, who always gives expert and apolitical analysis. Stephen, welcome to the show. So, Stephen, we've heard in the last hour that number 10 has fallen in line with GB News and is saying the police should have stopped these images being pr projected on there. They should have intervened. They brought shame to the nation. I'm asking you, in a legal framework, was projecting those images onto Big Ben a legal offence? Do the police have the powers to re enforce the removal of it? Yes or no? Well, it's good to see that uh, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is, is in fierce agreement with Suella Braverman on this issue, because when she was Home Secretary, she called out this phrase. And mm. I don't think we should talk about the specific case, because that can get uh, very uh, tricky. But we can talk hypothetically about projecting this phrase onto buildings or even chanting this phrase in the street. Uh, the act of projecting it onto a building is almost certainly a planning offence, if it's nothing else. But it, this phrase, if we, we, we need to analyse it. Okay? The, the claim that is being made by the Metropolitan Police is that it's a perfectly innocent phrase. Now, I'm not sure that that stands up to any scrutiny. You know, it, it means it, it's from the river, the river, the river Jordan, to the sea, the Mediterranean, Palestine will be free. Well, that, that's calling for the cancellation of Israel. And that, that does strike me as quite an offensive thing uh, to do. It, we, we, it's, it's ambiguous as to what happens to all of the current Jewish occupants of that land, but, but the implication is potentially genocidal. I would like to get some legal clarity on this and have a, an, an actual court look at it. But the block to gaining that legal clarity is the Metropolitan Police. And we really need to, I mean, I've called them the great do-nothings, because on this issue, they do seem to be performatively powerless and, and, and doing as little as they possibly can. Now, I've talked to uh, serving officers, and the, 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 this attitude is not at the operational level. The, the, what is happening is that the very senior levels, which must be the commissioner and must be the mayor of London, it must be, are, are, are blocking th these decisions. But they, they are using their discretion to block any legal clarity on whether or not this phrase is, is illegal. There's, there's a potential that it is. And are the Met abusing their discretion? Are they? And I think that we're at the stage now where we have to ask, are the Met abusing their discretion to block this going before okay. a judge? 
OK, Steve, let me add some more stuff. Um, there are laws, you're right, the unauthorised projections on parliamentary buildings laws were brought in in 2016 after a number of commercial enterprises had been products onto parliamentary buildings. So you're right, you do need permission, and that wasn't granted. But on the night itself, Stephen, I was there, and I spoke with officers in person. I think we have footage now. And I said to the officers, this is an offence, is it or not? And they said, yes, it is. There's the projector you can see on screen. It's a tiny device, Stephen, and there were no police anywhere near it, near it with any interest whatsoever in stopping it. And you're right to point out the specific nature of the, the message itself causes great offence. Stephen, this has been beamed around the world, bringing great shame on the UK. And surely, to that mob outside Parliament at that time, the context matters. The aggregating, aggravating factor surely is an issue, Stephen. It, it must be. And it's nice to hear that a serving officer is in agreement with the Prime Minister and a former Home Secretary and with me that, that this, this phrase is, is potentially an, an offence. Um, it, 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 is, it must be terribly distressing to, to British Jews. You know, it, it, just, it just must be. And I can't think of another group to whom we would allow this level of distress to happen. I mean, in, in, this, in, the, in, in the world of identity politics, you know, I belong to the, the little bisexual box. I cannot imagine anybody tolerating this level of abuse at, at bisexuals. I simply can't imagine that, that people would be permitted to, to be this abusive. And we know that people are being intimidated because the Speaker of the House of Commons said that MPs are being intimidated. So there is an intimidatory atmosphere going mm. in. There is a threatening atmosphere going on. I think, and I've written on this, I think that that potentially reaches the level of, of serious disorder and that the Met should use their powers to, to stop these protests. The Metropolitan okay. Police, once again, are performatively powerless and deny that they have powers. It, it, it's absolutely ridiculous, Martin. If it, if it came to, to you or I, the police would suddenly discover a whole big bag of laws that they've got to do things. Yeah. And yet, in certain instances, they are apparently unable to act. And as you, okay. as you okay. know, Stephen, I'm afraid we have to leave it there. Loads to talk about. We'll continue this conversation in the next hour as well. Please stay with us. I'm Martin Dormley on GB News, Britain's news channel. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good afternoon. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update with me, Annie, from the Met Office. There'll be further showers through the rest of the day. Some sunny spells too, but for all of us, it is feeling cooler than of late. That's as we've got a colder air mass upon us. It's much colder than we've seen through the rest of the beginning of February. We've got a westerly wind as well. That's been pushing in showers mainly to western areas so far today, but they will push into the east through the evening. So it will be a slightly damp evening across parts of the southeast. Further west, though, and north, it should turn a little dry drier as the night progresses and for many areas it will be dry by the morning however it's going to be much colder than recently tomorrow morning we'll likely see a frost quite widely also a risk of ice where we have seen any showers there's potential for some mist and fog to develop as well that could be slow to clear across central areas through Saturday morning but away from that it should be dry and bright to start the day cloud will bubble up as the day progresses though and we will see a risk of showers through the afternoon however the showers will be lighter and fewer than on Friday, so you've got a less of a chance of seeing them. And in any sunshine, it won't feel too bad. Highs of around 9 or 10 degrees in the south. There'll be another cold start to the day on Sunday, but we will see some more persistent rain spreading in across the south. There is some uncertainty in exactly the details of how widespread that will be across the south. However, it does look like it will clear into Monday to give us a fine start to the new week, but further rain will arrive in the north on Tuesday. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
Patrick Christie's Tonight. Weekdays from 9pm. Can do you find the Union flag, the Union Jack divisive? Um, in some situation, but as Simon quite clearly state, and I agree with everything that he says in, in regards that this situation, when people use it for ulterior motive, to cause fear, alarm and distress. We saw that with the far right when they came up to say protecting the Churchill statues and things of that nature. But largely on the large whole, even I wave the St. George's flag on a sport, sporting occasion. And I don't see anything wrong in, in raising the Union Jack or the St. George's flag mm. on, so long as the, the, the intention is, is correct. And as he says, Mr. Brockers, he served for the country and he should have every right to be proud of what he's done and the way that he wants to display it. All right, Simon, what do you make of this kind of, I would argue it as like student social media based politics where you get these pillocks from the Green Party who are saying, oh, it's divisive and I can't believe it. It will be legal in this country to do. Do, do those people need to get out more? I was on the streets of Stratford earlier on, an incredibly diverse place, speaking to a massive range of people right across different age demographics. I couldn't find a single sausage who said to me that they thought that this guy from the Green Party was right. He obviously has absolutely no attention from anybody. And this is his way of finding attention. Both Ken and I, myself, we both agree that nobody should use any symbol of national identity to offend others deliberately. Because that's just inflaming a situation. There's so much sensitivity around so many things today, and people do get offended by so much so quickly without any rhyme or reason. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Good afternoon, it's 4pm and a very happy Friday afternoon to you. Welcome to the Martin Daubney Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Coming up on today's show, after Wednesday's protests outside Parliament, I'll be joined by Nigel Farage from America to discuss Suella Braverman's claim that Islamists are now in charge of Great Britain. And on the second anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we'll ask the great British public whether we should keep spending billions and billions of taxpayers' pounds on the Ukrainians' war effort. And there's finally some good news for millions of people who are struggling to pay their energy bills. And that's all on the way in your next action-packed hour. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Your company is always a huge pleasure. Thank you. Loads and loads to get through. The scenes on Wednesday, shamed Britain, Big Ben, a billboard for anti-Semitic messages projected around the world. Today, Number 10 has dramatically said they back GB News's position. The police should have intervened. They should have stopped that, but they didn't. Why not? I'm asking you the question. Why are the police standing away and letting the mob getting away with it? Is it cowardice? Is it bad orders? Or are the mob simply now running the streets? And the poison on the streets is flowed into Parliament. Does Suella Braverman have a point? Have the Islamists now taken over Britain? Get in touch. The all the usual ways, GB views at gbnews.com. I'll also ask Nigel Farage for his take on that. That's coming shortly. You will not want to miss that. But first, your latest news headlines with Ray Addison. Thanks, Martin. Good afternoon. Two minutes past four, our top stories. Former Post Office Chief Executive Paula Venels has been stripped of her CBE by the King following the Horizon IT scandal. And she was heavily criticised for routinely denying any problems with the system, which led to the wrongful prosecution of hundreds of sub-postmasters. She was appointed a CBE in December of 2018 and announced that she planned to hand it back with immediate effect last month. She'll now formally lose the title for bringing the honours system into disrepute. 
Well, police have confirmed that three children whose bodies were found at a home in Bristol died from knife injuries. Seven-year-old Faraz Bash, three-year-old Jury and nine-month-old Mohammed were found dead in the Sea Mills area on Sunday. The 42-year-old woman, arrested on suspicion of their murder, remains in hospital and is being treated for non-life-threatening injuries. A vigil is due to be held later in memory of the children. ISIS bride Shemaima Begum has lost an appeal over the removal of her British citizenship. The now 24-year-old was a teenager when she left the UK to travel to Syria and joined the so-called Islamic State. Her citizenship was later revoked on national security grounds. Begum's solicitor, Daniel Furler, has promised to continue fighting until she's back home. We are going to keep fighting. I, I, I want to say that I'm, I'm sorry to Shamima and to her family that after five years of fighting, she still hasn't received justice in the British court. And to promise her and to promise the government that we're not going to stop fighting. Britain has signed a new deal with the EU's border agency in a further bid to stop small boat crossings. The agreement with Frontex will see UK border force cooperate more closely with its European counterparts on intelligence and training. 1,716 people have been intercepted crossing the channel illegally so far this year. James Cleverly says the deal will help tackle the problem. It means we can share information quicker, share intelligence quicker, we can operate more effectively. And the reason that's important is because the EU wants to secure its external borders just as we do. So people who are coming into Europe from uh, Eastern Europe, across the Mediterranean, the European Union wants to stop them. We want to help them stop them because those people filter through Europe and ultimately find themselves on small boats coming across to the UK. A Sudanese asylum seeker has been detained for nine years and six months for the manslaughter of four migrants who drowned trying to cross the English Channel. In a retrial at Canterbury Crown Court, Ibrahim Abar was found guilty of piloting an unseaworthy inflatable between France and the UK in December 2022. He claimed that smugglers threatened to kill him if he refused to drive the boat, but the prosecution said he owed the passengers a duty of care. The jury reached a majority verdict of 10 to 2 in what is believed to be the first conviction of its kind. Thousands of residents have been evacuated from their homes in Plymouth, where a World War II bomb was found. The 500-kilogram unexploded device was found in a garden on Tuesday morning in the Keyham area. The MOD says the operation to remove it safely has led to one of the largest peacetime evacuations since the Second World War. The bombs being moved through the city for disposal at sea. Residents living within 300 metres of the convoy route have been told to leave the area until 5 o'clock this evening. Households will see their energy bills fall to the lowest level in two years. Energy regulator Ofgem has announced it's dropping the price cap by 12.3% in response to wholesale prices, effective from April. It means a typical energy bill will fall by £238 to £1,690. The biggest ever drug bust has been made by UK authorities in what's being called a major blow to drug cartels. 5.7 tonnes of cocaine, with a street value of more than £450 million, was found in a container at Southampton Port, which was transporting bananas from South America. National Crime Agency officers believe the haul was heading to Hamburg, but they say a significant proportion of the drug would have ended up back in the UK. Well, cannabis has now been legalised in Germany. Chancellor Olaf Scholz's ruling three-party coalition voted to allow the cultivation of three plants and private consumption of up to 25 grams of the drug. Larger scale production will also be allowed for members of cannabis clubs. It's hoped the change will help crack down on the black market and drug-related crime. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or why not go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now back to Martin.
Thank you, Ray. Now, we've got so much to get our teeth stuck into this hour. Let's crack on. And we start, of course, with those comments from the former Home Secretary, Suella Braverman. And she said that Islamists are now in charge of Britain. Mrs Bradman made that claim just a couple of days after those infamous protests outside Westminster. On Wednesday night, a number of messages, including the words from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, were projected onto the Elizabeth Tower, which is, of course, home to Big Ben. Suella Bradman wrote in the Daily Telegraph this morning, the truth is that the Islamists, the extremists and the anti-Semites are in charge now. They have bullied the Labour Party, they have bullied our institutions, and now they have bullied our country into submission. Amazing, powerful words, and I'm joined now to dissect them in the studio by our political editor, Chris Hope. Chris, pleasure to have you back, as ever. You got a line earlier on from number 10, uh, reacting yeah. to the projected images on Big Ben. And, of course, GB News was quick out the block on this saying this is another outrage, and yet the police stood by and did absolutely yeah. nothing. Well, you were, Martin, you're doing your work as a reporter out there with your camera phone, filming that little sort of little unit there, about the size of my, well, this yeah. GB News mug, I think, That's from right. memory, filming that those offensive words on the side of the Elizabeth Tower, Big Ben, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. That language is used to describe the destruction of the State of Israel mm. um, and is deeply offensive to Israel, obviously, and also to Jews living here. Number 10 has stepped in after you said, why didn't the police step in? There was laws allowing them to do yeah. so. You saw the projector, it was untouched. You asked policemen locally why weren't they touching it. No answer was given. Number 10 is making very clear it was wrong for this to have happened. They say to us today, this is the deputy um, official spokesman for the PM, so he speak, she is speaking for the PM, um, that, you know, it, it, operational choices are made by the police and we're not going to go near that, Number 10 says. But at the same time, most people would agree, irrespective of operational decisions, um, what happened was wrong. Um, and where they're very mindful and they urge people to be mindful of the fear and distress that would cause. So mm. the, clearly, number 10 is unhappy about this, but they are saying they will not get along with operational decisions. The, the issue there is one for the Met Police to address, not number 10, but very, very serious. And that language there from mm. Sola Braven, you said, I was struck mm. also by the by, by she talked about Keir Starmer. The Tories are attacking Keir Starmer mm. for putting the Speaker in about in a difficult position over the amendment of Labour, this get-out-of-free card that the Speaker gave Labour MPs land mm. to vote for their policy not the SNP's policy or government policy on, on the ceasefire. She was saying that um, uh, the Sasuke Osama had effectively taken the Speaker hostage by bringing Parliament in disrepute. Really strong language there for mm. Sir Braveman. And I understand we've got Lee Anderson on at five o'clock in an hour's time. He said to me earlier on that there's possibility that um, Sasuke Osama has been reported to the Parliamentary Standards Committee for this. Well, I'm sure all, all options are open. I doubt that will happen or, or succeed. It's a political matter. I do also note Sadiq Khan, who's the mayor of London, running for office this May. She say, he says the following. Sarah Braveman seems to be doing her best to outflank Enoch Powell. Now, he's the Tory MP from the past, the minister who made the remarks, the rivers of blood remarks, which, which inflamed racial tensions. And Sadiq Khan is also the de facto police and crime commissioner for London, he's where all this stuff Met. is happening on the streets. So it's a bit rich of him. Oh. to be deflecting on to Suella Bradman when this anarchy is happening effectively on we his watch. an election year, Martin. Election, general election later this year, mayoral elections in Greater Manchester, uh, London and elsewhere in May. The city can't carry on. It's a poisonous attempt to drive a wedge between our communities and serve her own, Suella Bradman's naked ambition. Now more than ever, we should be seeking to unite, not divide. It, the language of Suella Bradman is raised attention today in Westminster. OK, well, now we can get the words of Nigel Farage, who joins us from America. Nigel, welcome to the show. Nigel, it's, it's absolutely kicking off this side of the pond. Suella Braverman has waded in today, saying the Islamists have taken over. Nigel, you've been, you've been talking on this for a long time. What's your situation about the unfolding anarchy on British streets? Uh, depressing, upsetting, uh, but I'm afraid, from my perspective, entirely predictable. Uh, this is the direct result of irresponsible immigration policies from both Labour and Conservative governments over the course of the last 25 years. The encouragement of multiculturalism, the encouragement of identity politics, the encouragement of everybody having a label and everybody being separate, rather than us all being treated equally before the law. This is where we've got to, and I'm afraid, 
add to that a lack of moral courage and leadership coming from government, coming from the Church of England. We've forgotten who we are. We've forgotten what we are. We are a very tolerant country. We believe in freedom of religious expression. Of course we do. But here's the point. Everything we believe in, everything we've built over the last thousand years and more is based on family, nation, and underpinning all of it are Judeo-Christian principles. I mean, they're right through our constitutional settlement and everything else. And we've forgotten that. We're afraid to stand up for that. And now it's that that is being crushed. And to see fear stalking the corridors of Westminster in the way that it is, is, is a deep international humiliation for our nation. And Nigel, I saw your show last night and you were showing those shameful images of Big Ben with those messages on from the river to the sea. And number 10 has waded in in the last hour this side of the pond again, agreeing with GB News that that projector should have been taken down. The police should have intervened. Yet, Nigel, once again, they didn't. They stood off and they let the mob do their worst. Yeah, well, two points there, Martin. Uh, the police's behaviour on this, ever since the first pro-Palestinian march in London on the Saturday following the October the 7th obscenities, um, ever since, it's been a hands-off approach uh, and people chanting things in the street. I mean, if you and I were doing that, I mean, we'd be locked up in short order. And the second point goes back to what I was saying a moment ago about moral courage and leadership. The fact that number 10 has come out in the last hour and said this is an act of followership. They can see what we're saying, they can see where public opinion's going, so they say, oh, we better say something and go with it. Number 10, the Prime Minister should have said something about it as soon as it happened. But I'm afraid there is no leadership, there is no courage. And Nigel, I'm also joined in the studio by Chris Hope. He's got a question he'd like to fire at you. Nigel, uh, Chris here in the studio in London. You are speaking at CPAC shortly. What are you doing in America? Do you want to be in politics over there as well? <coughs> Chris, I've been coming to CPAC for over a decade. And the first time I was here, a lot of people asked the question, what's a Brit doing going to an American Conservative conference. And I was the only foreign speaker on the stage. This year, over 20 countries are represented, including the presidents of El Salvador, the president of Argentina, senior representatives from countries all over Europe, Australia, Japan. So, so what has happened is that CPAC has become the meeting place for genuine conservative movements from right across the world, including, of course, this year, a former British prime minister as well. Here, of course, you want to be the uh, UK ambassador <coughs> to uh, uh, America uh, if Donald Trump, your mate, wins the election. Now, you know, I wrote that story with The Telegraph se uh, seven years ago now. Is it really going to happen? Is that what you want? I tell you what I want. I want to make sure that an incoming Starmer government has a good relationship if we have an incoming Trump administration. Why do I say that? The relationships between our countries have never been more important. And that's not just in terms of trade and investment and money and, of course, culture, which we share to the most extraordinary degree. No, I'm talking about NATO. I'm talking about defence. I'm talking about the safety of the West. And given that Keir Starmer's party have got senior figures like David Lammy, who've said very disobliging things about President Trump, given, and we've had confirmation of this, that there's been no reach out from Starmer towards the Trump campaign. He will need somebody in Washington that is a bridge between them and the American administration. And the last thing they should do is to appoint somebody with an Oxbridge first and a career in the Foreign Office. They won't even get through the front door of the Oval Office at what is a crucial time for global security with perhaps the threat of war been closer than it's been at any point in our lifetimes. All I'm saying is, if it's not me, it needs to be someone like me, it needs to be somebody who can build bridges between a Starmer administration that's been abusive and an incoming Trump presidency. And I think, in the national interest, that makes a lot of sense.
Nigel, um, a lot of people will be looking to America and saying, well, it looks like Trump's going to get back in. And we look back to Britain and we seem to be facing our darkest hours with what's going on here. A lot of people saying there's a Trump sized hole in Britain. Is that a job that you should fill? <laughs> Oh, well, look, and I don't think this interview should be an extended job interview uh, for a variety of things that I might and might not do. For now, I'm here at CPAC as a speaker, but I'm also here carrying the GB News flag, uh, and I'm very pleased to say an increasing number of people walking past are coming, stopping, and saying, yes, we've heard of GB News. So the channel isn't just, Martin, as you've pointed out, leading debate and conversation in Britain with a remarkable degree of influence, we're becoming better known here, too. That's great. So thank you very much for joining us, Nigel Farage. Good luck at CPAC later on. Thank you. Always a pleasure to have you on. And as well, Christopher Hope, thank you for joining us in the studio. Great start to the hour. Now we'll have lots more on this huge story. At 5 o'clock, of course, I'll be joined then by Lee Anderson. And there's plenty of coverage on our website, gbnews.com, and you've helped to make it the fastest-growing national news website in the country. So thank you very much. Now there's less than one hour to go for you to enter our great British giveaway and give yourself a chance to win 18 grand in cold, hard tax-free cash that's the best kind of cash you can get and here's all the details that you need to get your entry in on time make sure you don't miss your chance to win eighteen thousand pounds in cash to spend please and i won the great british giveaway you hear about people winning things all the time but you don't actually know anyone that wins them so i sometimes think oh i'll never be me uh, and if i can win it anybody can win it obviously whoever wins it next is going to be as happy as i was uh, and they're going to get even more money this time round, so why wouldn't you go in the draw? For another chance to win £18,000 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB02 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm today. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Good luck. Great stuff. Now, it's exactly two years since Russia invaded Ukraine. And we've been asking the great British public the big question. Should we keep spending billions of pounds of British taxpayers' money to help the Ukrainians? Or is it time to pull out? I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focused, tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. You want to talk by cars growing by a couple of centimetres a year? Yeah, well, one centimetre every two years. Okay. It's unrelenting because the um, people are so, so fixated on the big SUVs, the sales have gone through the roof, and yet it's um, James Nix, the analyst for Transport and Environment Campaign, said the author of the report on the trend said, spurred on by sales of the largest SUVs, vehicles are getting wider every year. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, it means that it's our roads weren't... It's a comfortable ride, beautiful <laughs> engines, <laughs> I mean, it's luxury, it's gorgeous. Well, as I know, I used to have uh, two, um, but I, I don't... You used to have two SUVs? Well, one SUV at a time but I had two brands right. of them. Um, but I'd no longer drive in London now because I just don't see the point because of the ULEs, because of the, you know, you could yeah. run down a thing and get fined. Parking spaces, whatever. Says, yeah. yeah, the growth in car size also causes issues for their drivers. The report found that largely luxury SUVs, which are about two metres wide, no longer fit in off-street parking. That's true. They also leave too little space for passengers to get in and out of the vehicles in typical off-street spaces, and they're about two point four metres wide, the report found. Well, and I'll tell you, I was stuck in a bus last night trying to get uh -huh. home, and the buses couldn't move because the streets were too crammed with all of these massive cars mm. either side. Chelsea and it was 
gridlocked. Yeah, maybe they're not the problem. Maybe the buses are the problem. The buses take people to their place well, of work well, and get I'd them like all. to know when, because when I go through London, all I see is empty buses. Oh, well, you're lucky. Buses. Every time I'm on one, they're full. Well, they're obviously only full at rush hour. Mm. You see, the thing is, uh, property developers, when they do high-rise car parks or, you know, they build a, a multiplex cinema and there's a car park attached to it, that's not my fault that I can't fit into their space. <laughs> the, it's, you know, it's their fault. So well, what, it's all what, driven by what, money, isn't it? The more spaces well, that they have, exactly. the more people they can get. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. And now viewers on GB News can see live pictures from Plymouth. And they're about to dispose of an unexploded Second World War bomb in the sea there. The bomb was found in a garden on Tuesday. And when the bomb goes bang, we'll make sure to cut back and show you the action. Now, it's the second anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And with no end to the war in sight, there are fears that the West will reduce its support for Ukraine. The Foreign Secretary, Lord David Cameron, is speaking at the United Nations General Assembly about Ukraine right now. And our home and security, Mark White, has this special report. Across large parts of eastern and southern Ukraine, the war with Russia continues to rage. And as this conflict enters its third year, the scale of the destruction and the number of casualties inflicted on both sides has been immense. The Ukrainian army was widely praised for its early successes, driving the numerically superior and better equipped Russian military back from significant chunks of the territory it seized in the early days of the invasion. But military analysts agree the war of late appears to have reached stalemate. When I think about it now, I can't help but think about World War I, 1916, 1917, offensive operations capturing very little ground, a lot of casualties, and doesn't seem to be making any advances one way or the other. So I think we're in a stalemate situation. And I rather suspect this is going to be the case for some time. There's no doubt Ukraine has defied the odds in ensuring Russia, for now at least, is unable to do much more than defend the current territory it holds. An assessment of Ukraine's achievements so far by the UK's Ministry of Defence estimates the country's armed forces have recaptured 50% of the territory Russia seized in 2022. 350,000 Russian troops are believed to have been killed or injured. 2,600 Russian tanks have been destroyed over the past two years, and almost 5,000 Russian armoured vehicles have also been destroyed. On the Ukrainian side, at least 30,000 civilians have been killed, probably many more. The number of military deaths is a closely guarded secret, but some estimates put it as high as 70,000. In this war of attrition, Ukraine is running desperately short of artillery shells and ammunition. And with last year's counter-offensive failing to achieve the significant gains Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky had hoped for, he's now removed his top general. Add to that serious concerns surrounding continued support from the United States, with the Republicans repeatedly blocking a new military aid package for Ukraine. The spectre of a new Donald Trump presidency just compounds the concern in Kyiv that Ukraine's biggest supplier of military aid may no longer be as committed to its defence. 
One Russian opposition politician believes that ultimately the war is unlikely to be won on the battlefield and instead needs new leadership in the Kremlin. I think that this war at the end of the day will not end in Ukraine. It will end in Moscow. The origin of the problem is in Moscow. The source of the problem is in Moscow and uh, it should be treated in Moscow. And uh, that's what I am currently doing. I am campaigning for all the different Western nations to come to this realization and help our regiments in the front lines and our groups inside Russia uh, to grow and uh, to be able to change this regime from within. For now, at least, there seems little prospect of Vladimir Putin's removal, enforced or otherwise. And he's on course to once again win the country's presidential elections next month. Moscow has also now shifted to a wartime economy and invested huge sums in its military, which the West is struggling to match. After another year of massive battlefield losses on both sides, neither country has the advantage. But Ukraine and Russia agree on one thing. There's no prospect of a ceasefire and negotiations anytime soon. So this bloody conflict is set to rage on, testing not just Ukraine's ability to keep fighting, but its allies resolve in staying the course and continuing to supply the military aid this country so desperately needs. Mark White, GB News. Great stuff there from Mark White. Now, the UK has pledged more than £12 billion in overall support to Ukraine in these past two years. When we went out and about in Birmingham to ask people there whether it was time to stop spending so much money. I believe we should send the money and I believe we do need to continue sending the money. They, you know, these people are in devastation and, you know, something needs to be done to help them, really. I think it's a good thing that we're sending aid and helping those that are in need. But at the same time, we're also in a cost of living crisis here and we've got lots of people that need assistance here. Uh, well, I think it's unfair to be distributing money abroad when people here are, lying, uh, are on the street, are sleeping on the street. People are hungry, children, you know... They're not getting the help and the support that they need from the government. And I think it's outrageous to send that amount of money abroad to do anything else, you know, without consideration for the people who live in England. Uh, to be quite honest, it's disgusting. Because the simple reason is we're paying literally on top of what is still going on and they want more money. This is just money used to fund warfare rather than to fund the welfare. So it's, it's yeah, pointless. It sounds a lot, but I think in the, in the scheme of things, um, you know, in, ter in terms of what it stands for, it's, it's, I think we've got to keep going. You can't stop. Thank you. Now, I've got hundreds of emails come in today, loads and loads on the Islamist intimidation. I want to read this one out from Susan. This hate message on Big Ben allowed by the Metropolitan Police was an insult and a disgrace to our country. Also, these demonstrations on Saturdays have become nothing short now of civil disobedience. Christina says this moving message. My Jewish daughter-in-law is now afraid to go into central London. These protests should stop. At the moment, I am ashamed to be British and quickly on the case of Shamima Begum having her appeal turned down. Kevin says this. I wonder how long it will be before Shamima decides to play the I think I'll convert to Christianity card. Nice one there from Kevin. Now, there's lots more still to come between now and five o'clock, and I'll discuss the new report that claims working-class viewers are turning off the BBC and turning on to GB News because they think the BBC is simply too woke. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Ray Addison. Thanks, Martin. 431, our top stories. Former post office chief executive Paula Venels has been stripped of her CBE by the King following the Horizon IT scandal. She was heavily criticised for routinely denying any problems with the system, which led to the wrongful prosecution of hundreds of sub postmasters. She'll formally lose the title for bringing the honours system into disrepute. 
Well, police have confirmed three children whose bodies were found at a home in Bristol died from knife injuries. Seven-year-old Faraz Bash, three-year-old Jury and nine-month-old Mohammed were found dead in the Sea Mills area on Sunday. A 42-year-old woman arrested on suspicion of their murder remains in hospital. An asylum seeker has been sentenced to nine years and six months for the manslaughter of four migrants who drowned trying to cross the channel. Ibrahim Abar was found guilty of piloting an unseaworthy inflatable between France and the UK in December of 2022. He claimed that smugglers threatened to kill him if he refused to drive the boat, but the prosecution said he owed the passengers a duty of care. ISIS bride Shumaima Begum has lost an appeal over the removal of her British citizenship. The now 24-year-old was a teenager when she left the UK to travel to Syria and joined the so-called Islamic State. Her citizenship was later revoked on national security grounds. Begum's solicitor has vowed to continue fighting until she is back home. Thousands of residents have been evacuated from their homes in Plymouth after the discovery of an unexploded World War II bomb. The 500-kilogram device was found in a garden in the Kiam area. The MOD says the operation to remove it has led to one of the largest peacetime evacuations since the Second World War. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thank you, Ray. Now, there's good news for millions of British households at long last that are struggling to pay their gas and electric bills. I'll have all that after this. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9 30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. The EU rules are trying to choke even that. Yeah, yeah. And I just think, you know, it's I would join this protest yeah. in a heartbeat. And, and you are right to point out this stuff about them being right-wing. How dare they yeah. slate them as right-wing when these these are these are real people whose livelihoods And remember, a lot of people who work in the farm industry, Malone, they get paid very little money. They get paid... They Agricultural work. workers are very badly they, paid. They get paid nothing, Pierce. And, you know, the profits... I think on Clark and Farmer read somewhere that, that I saw that when you sell, it like, a sheep, a sheep's skin, yes. it's 30 pence That's or something. Right. And yeah. you say, what? Yeah. And, and, and so you, you, you wonder how they can manage that. And I think after a year, Clarkson made a handful of pounds. He made, like, 90 yeah. quid profit <laughs> yeah, yeah. in a whole year working. Um, but Carol makes a really good point, though, doesn't she, Nikki, about this idea that we eat... The, we go to the supermarkets, we yeah. shop there, we eat our food. We don't often give it a thing. And the farmers have become so frustrated by this idea that they are not respected. Absolutely. I mean, they're running what are effectively small businesses, often yeah. family businesses that are being passed down through generations. They also tend to know the land and the animals better than anyone else in those areas. You know, I am all for green protests. You know, I'm all for climate change activism. But actually... The only way you can do that is uh, gradually. The only, it's exactly what we've seen with Port Talbot. You know, you can't just go in and say, you're not going to do it anyway anymore this way. You're You've got to do it this way instead. The Tartar Steel thing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You've got to do it this way instead. You know, I, lots of farmers are on board with protecting the planet, but they, they can't do it overnight. You've got right. to give them time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they're protesting, you know, they're saying no farmers, no food. When well, you it's say not you any more obvious. When you support these environmental protests, you're not one of these closet supporters <laughs> just up oil, are you? I'm not closet supporter. I think You're I've been, out, I think I've been quite open about just oh, oil. No. I don't like all their methods, but I do like the like message. But I do appreciate I like the message. Yeah, but sometimes but you've got to do difficult Nikki, things. What they're asking for now, those protesters, are unrealistic. What these protesters are asking for is not unrealistic. No.
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back. It's 4.37. You're watching or listening to Martin Dormley on GB News. Now, a little later in this hour, I'll talk about the anti-EU feeling that's sweeping the continent. Vive la spirit of Brexit. Now, there's finally some good news for the millions of people who are struggling to pay their energy bills. The average household bill will fall to its lowest point in two years from April after Ofgem lowered its price gap. Well, here to go through all the details is our expert analyst. It's with our economics and business editor, Liam Halligan, with On The Money. Liam, it's always a pleasure to have you in the studio. It's been a long, cold, bleak winter <laughs> for British beleaguered bill payers, finally. Oh, is the sun coming through the clouds, Liam? God, you're good, Martin. That's why you get the big bucks. <laughs> um, it hasn't actually been that cold a winter. It's been no. quite a mild winter uh, on historic levels, as last winter was quite mild. We've had two relatively mild winters since Putin invaded Ukraine two years ago in February 2022. And the fact that we've had those mild winters has kept electricity prices and gas prices, while much higher than they were before that invasion, mm. lower than they otherwise could have been. So today, this morning, the energy regulator Ofgem, they announced that the average household using the average amount of combined gas and electricity will get a bill of £1,690. That's on an annual basis from April the 1st, and that's down from £1,928. That's a 12% drop, a saving of around £20 a month. It's worth saying, while that is a lot better than it could have been, our combined gas and electricity bills, Martin, are still 50% mm. higher, roughly, than they were before Russia invaded Ukraine, an event which, of course, sent global energy markets into complete turmoil, left the UK and Western Europe particularly exposed because we were the ones heavily dependent on Russian gas. We had to wean ourselves off that gas. We have to some extent, largely because we've been importing shed loads, a technical term, of gas, billions of cubic metres, there is the technical term, of wholesale gas from America in the form of liquefied natural gas that comes over on ships. That is itself is expensive, carbon intensive and all the rest of it. But the upshot is that off gems lower the energy price cap. That lower cap will be in place from April until the end of June. Now, Liam, we hear all the time about the price at petrol pumps is up like a rocket and it falls like a feather. Yeah. Why is it taking so long for prices to stabilise? It's been two years today since the Ukraine war. Because global gas markets are very, very volatile and very, very susceptible to news from mm. Russia, news from Ukraine, which, of course, is itself very, very volatile, given, you know, is Congress going to back the Ukrainian army? We don't really know. Are the German government going to back the Ukrainian army? We don't really know. Are Russia going to win? We don't really know, though most analysts think that Russia certainly aren't going to lose. Mm. Though there's a difference between winning and not losing, of course. So the situation is relatively unknown. Um, that links to wholesale gas prices. That links to household energy bills. It's worth saying also that the energy providers, the energy companies, they've done a deal with Ofgem where they're allowed to charge all of us uh, around two and a half quid a month, mm. a special charge. That will help the energy companies, they say, help customers who are indebted. Now, we do hear about customers that are indebted with their energy companies. We also hear about a lot of customers that have 
money on account with energy companies that they can't get back. Oh, my energy, how often have I heard in the pub, my energy company owes me two grand and they won't give it back to me and I've spent you know, hours on the phone trying to get hold of it. So I'm not sure of the relative balances of customers versus energy providers, but it's clear from the off-gem rubric today that the energy providers are being allowed to charge around £2.33 a month to address, quotes, the debt backlog. But I'm not sure where that debt backlog lies. We do know that quite a lot of energy providers went out of business when uh, energy prices weren't very, very high and they couldn't pass those huge spikes on to their customers. And when the energy companies go out of business, they have to be bailed out by other energy companies. Mm. So I do understand that the balance sheets of the energy companies is very, very important. Though I'm not quite clear, I will be investigating... Uh, why it is that Ofgem has allowed them to charge everybody for a debt backlog that everybody hasn't incurred. Mm, super stuff. As ever, Liam Halligan, always on the money. Thank you so much for your expert analysis. Cheers, mate. Now, led the way with Brexit. And now lots of more countries are sick and tired of the European Union. We've got massive elections coming up, of course, in June. And the spirit of Brexit, it appears to be catching on across the continent. We'll have more on that after this. I'm Martin Dalby on GB News, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. The Camilla Tomini Show, Sunday mornings from 9.30. Questions to be answered, and there seem to be a significant amount, does once again point its way to a public inquiry into exactly what happened in this case. Starmer's called for that. Would you call for that too? I, I certainly think that, 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 first of all, there's one thing that's happening now. The NHS have to uh, order an independent inquiry. That's been done. So they've got to look at all the whys and wherefores of what happened with this man. If it appears that we're not getting sufficient depth and breadth to this, then I think having an inquiry with all the powers that that brings would be extremely advantageous. What I don't want is some long-winded inquiry that will take years, mm. by which time other people will have been put at risk and maybe other lives have lost. We know what the problems are here, Camilla. Law's been passed on mm. this. This is all about making sure on the ground we implement uh, 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 the highest degree of monitoring in order to ensure the safety of the public. Has care in the community failed? I mean, it seems oxymoronic to say that it's care in the community in this case. Mm. We know that uh, the number of psychiatric care beds has been slashed from 52,000 back in 2001 mm. to 24,000 now. Mm. I've anecdotally, because I wrote my column about this in The Telegraph yesterday, received quite a lot of correspondence from people saying the situation with care in the community is dire. People aren't be adequately monitored. Was it a mistake to close down all of those mental institutions? I don't think we should go back to that those days when we had those appalling institutions where we just lock people away and forget about them. And not just mental health people, but autistic people and mm. disabled people. Horrific way to mm. treat individuals. And you know I campaign on that a lot. I know. However... I think if we move into a more uh, community-based approach, which can be really good for many, many people who are on the spectrum and on that scale of mental health, we have to remember there will be a, 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 a small but significant number who will continue to pose a danger. Okay. And that's why monitoring is so important. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 4.46. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, at 5 o'clock, Tory MP Lee Anderson, the Red Wall Rottweiler, will join me to discuss Suella Braverman's sensational claim today that Islamists are now in charge of Britain. You will not want to miss that. 
Now, we led the way with Brexit, and now lots more European countries are also getting sick and tired of the European Union. On this programme, we've covered the farmers' protests across the continent, and the most spectacular scenes, of course, were in Brussels, which is, of course, the heart of the EU, its Death Star. The farmers have also demonstrated in France, Spain, Germany and many other countries. And established parties are expected to get a kicking in this year's EU elections with populist parties proving more and more popular all over Europe. Well, on that point now, let's cross live to Brussels and speak to journalist Jack Parrock, great friend of the show. Jack, the member states are revolting. It seems the spirit of Brexit is catching on. What's the political picture across the 27 member states? Well, we've had a really interesting week this week. It really feels like the starting gun for June's European uh, Parliament elections has been launched. And that really came when the sort of biggest group in the European Parliament, the European People's Party, the centre-right uh, group, they announced that the sitting European Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, that she will be their lead candidate to keep her job after the elections coming in June. Now, as you mentioned, the big sort of discussion is what will happen to the right wing parties after the elections and how, if, will they be able to club together into some kind of uh, collective grouping as they do within the European Parliament to wield some major power? Will one of those right wing collective groups? become the third biggest for the first time in the European Parliament's history. And that's something that's becoming really the focus of how this will operate. We're hearing lots of comments, surges in popularity for the AFD, the, the, the far right party in Germany. They self-define as a far right party. Marine Le Pen's uh, National Rally Party in France. They're looking set to do very well. Could be France's potentially biggest party. Uh, the polls, you know, are, are moving around a lot at the moment. And as you mentioned, this is all in the context of these farmers' protests. The, uh, the tractors that we're seeing on screen now, they're expected to hit Brussels again on Monday for another protest. In towards Paris, as we understand, Jack, and also in Poland and the Netherlands, expected to see populist uprise. And I think you're exactly right, thinking ahead when they all form coalitions inside Brussels, when, they, when they're sworn in and start serving in July, we could see a big body gravitating together and causing chaos within the chambers of Brussels and Strasbourg. Yeah, I mean, so it's a really, really complicated political makeup, as you know, within the European Parliament. But essentially, it rests on groups of national political parties from different countries that sort of come together. They're often quite uncomfortable alliances. And the European People's Party is the sort of centre-right Christian Democrat party um, that has for a long time been the biggest party in the European Parliament. Then there's the S&D group, the Socialist Parties. Labour used to sit in that group. And for a long time, the the Liberals have been the third biggest party. But what it's looking like is that there's a chance for the ECR group, which is a, the party that the, the British Conservatives actually started to leave the more traditional European People's Party, the centre-right group. That group is taking in some figures, some offshoots of some of France's quite hard-right uh, politics, friends of Marine Le Pen. Her niece is actually going into that party as well. And that is not within what's called the cordon sanitaire, which is what the part, the groups of the parties will not work with the likes of Marine Le Pen's group. They will not work with the AFD, but they will work with the ECR. So if that group does work very well, it could then actually wield some significant power within European politics, EU politics anyway, after June's elections. Excellent stuff, Jack Parrock, as ever, an expert summary and the spirit of Brexit is catching on. It's going to be a fantastic election to watch in June. Will they finally find their spurs and go for that spirit of Brexit? Wow, it makes this mouth drool, doesn't it? So anyway, voters across Europe are fed up with the EU. And now it turns out, Kel surprise, that working class people in this country have had their fill of the BBC because it's simply too woke. 
A poll by the policy research business Public First found that more than half of viewers think the quality of BBC News has declined and become too politically correct. And the good news is that lots of those viewers, viewers are turning their backs on the Beeb and instead watching GB News. Welcome along. Please jump in. The water is lovely. And it's great to have you on board. Now, I'm joined now by the former BBC executive and presenter, Roger Bolton. Roger, we hear a lot about these reports. And by the way, welcome to the show. Always a pleasure. Do you think finally that we're reaching wear out points? Certainly for the working classes, 71% of Leave voters are saying they're simply turning off the BBC. Well, uh, the BBC has always had um, to ride two horses. On the one hand, it's required because of the licence fee to give something to everybody. And on the other hand, people expect it to be uh, to set standards and to cater for those things, perhaps, of the mass market doesn't. So when it gets it right, which is something like, you know, Strictly Come Dancing, it achieves both things. You know, everybody likes it and it's doing something different. Bake Off would be the same when it started. But it's getting increased. Roger's got, is, is Roger there? All right, I can talk about this, if not. Well, what this report says, what this brought, report says, basically, is that when they do the dramas and they do the current affairs differently, that's what people get fed up with. Rog, are you back? You're just in, get, getting warmed up there. I'm back. Yes, yes, I normally talk too much. No, I wasn't, I wasn't <laughs> talking at all. Yes, no, thank you for that. No, they're riding two horses, and the BBC always has, between if you do the licence fee, you've got to cater for everybody, and yet it's got to do things which are distinctive and those things that the market doesn't provide. That's getting increasingly difficult. The BBC has always had a problem out of London in particular. Radio 4, the further you work, go away from London, the fewer people listen. And I think, you know, to the southeast rest of the country. The BBC is trying to do something about that, moves its, uh, a lot of its um, programming uh, makers and others uh, out of London, but it's very difficult. And of course, there are now many more places that people can go to get alternative views. But I think reason, the reason that people perhaps are more unhappy with BBC News is because we live in very difficult times when, you know, there's people are disagreeing almost about everything. And when that happens, you know, the BBC can't be unifying organisation it likes to be when people are po poles apart. Brexit was a classic example. It tore people apart. Uh, by the way, you haven't mentioned, uh, I hope you do somewhere in your programmes, that Goldman Sachs issued a report saying the British economy is 5% less than it would have been if we hadn't had Brexit. But I won't go there. That's another matter. Well, oh, that's actually a classic market. example, Roger, a classic example, Roger, of a BBC um, mindset squeezing in a little Bob comment about Brexit at the end. But in a nutshell, um, it yeah. seems to be the news output that's offended people the most. Got 20 seconds. Give it, give it to us, Roger. Uh, I think in these circumstances when people have such divided opinions, you, nobody will like the news. Everybody will be unhappy. And the classic thing is you blame the messenger. The BBC has got a problem it, with, with working class people. We need a proper debate about what public service broadcasting is. But in these circumstances where nobody can agree, you can do what you do, take largely one side, and you have a group of satisfied people, or you can try okay. and hold... You try to hold it between the two and you resolve well, it. You're going to have to cut the BBC off. Oh, well, that's very, far very satisfying. Please stick with us. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News. got Lee Anderson next. You will not want to miss it. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Good afternoon. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update with me, Annie. From the Met Office, there'll be further showers through the rest of the day. Some sunny spells too, but for all of us, it is feeling cooler than of late. That's as we've got a colder air mass upon us. It's much colder than we've seen through the rest of the beginning of February. We've got a westerly wind as well. That's been pushing in showers mainly to western areas so far today, but they will push into the east through the evening. So it will be a slightly damp evening across parts of the southeast. Further west, though, and north, it should turn a little dry as the night progresses and for many areas it will be dry by the morning however it's going to be much colder than recently tomorrow morning we'll likely see a frost quite widely also a risk of ice where we have seen any showers there's potential for some mist and fog to develop as well that could be slow to clear across central areas through Saturday morning but away from that it should be dry and bright to start the day cloud will bubble up as the day progresses though and we will see a risk of showers through the afternoon however the showers will be lighter and 
and fewer than on Friday. So you've got a, less of a chance of seeing them. And in any sunshine, it won't feel too bad. Highs of around nine or 10 degrees in the south. There'll be another cold start to the day on Sunday, but we will see some more persistent rain spreading in across the south. There is some uncertainty in exactly the details of how widespread that will be across the south. However, it does look like it will clear into Monday to give us a fine start to the new week, but further rain will arrive in the north on Tuesday. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. Elon Musk has announced that the first patients to receive a groundbreaking brain implant <laughs> from Neuralink is recovering well. This is all a bit odd. Uh, the product, called Telepathy, uses a robot to surgically place a computer chip in a region of the brain that controls... Movement. Hmm. Yes, Elon Musk says that the first goal is to enable people to control a phone or a computer just by thinking. He says that initial tests show promising signs of brain activity, meaning that patients with paralysis could one, one day overcome their conditions. Hmm, not sure about this one. Joining us to discuss this breakthrough is applied futurist Tom Cheesewright. Tom, this sounds, uh, well, slightly terrifying. <laughs> I certainly think a lot of people will be thinking this is something out of a sci-fi horror rather than reality. But this is a technology that's been a long time coming. We've been developing direct brain computer interfaces for a long time, mostly for the sort of therapeutic reasons that are the initial goal, at least, of Elon Musk's Neuralink, to allow people who are perhaps quadriplegic to have direct control via their brains of initially a smartphone uh, and maybe ultimately artificial limbs or a wheelchair. It does seem fascinating how quickly this technology is moving on. I, I saw demonstrations perhaps a year or two ago of people playing a very simple Pong game just by thinking, moving sort of one uh, line on a screen up and down. This seems like potentially there has been a breakthrough that means far more complex things can be controlled just by thinking. Well, there's lots of different aspects to this technology. The initial attempts to interface with the brain use actually quite thick prongs almost that went into the brain and they were quite solid and so if the brain moved they could potentially cause damage. I'm Christopher Hope and I'm Gloria Di Piero bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Every Wednesday we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head to head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, it's 5pm and a very happy Friday afternoon to you. Welcome to Martin Gorby Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Today, after Wednesday's protests outside Parliament, I'll be joined by Lee Anderson, the Red Wall Rottweiler, and he'll discuss Suella Braverman's sensational claim that Islamists are now in charge of this once great Britain. Next, Shamima Begum has lost her latest battle to get her British citizenship back. How long before she plays the I'm a Christian card? And I'll also discuss the claim that the closer Sakir Starmer gets to power, the more he seems to behave like Jeremy Corbyn. And that's all coming up in your next hour. Thank you for joining me on this Friday afternoon. Your company is always a huge pleasure. 
so many emails today. I'm surrounded by them. A huge sentiment and outpouring of anger and outrage about what's happened this week in politics on the streets. The mob winning. The streets, the poison pouring into Parliament. Parliamentarians being intimidated by what's going on outside. Who's running the country? Have the police given up? And, as Swella Bradman sensationally claims today in the Daily Telegraph, is it the Islamists that have taken over? I've got Lee Anderson after the news. You will not want to miss his take on this. But first, let's get those news headlines with Ray Edison. Thanks, Martin. One minute past five. Our top stories this hour. Former post office chief executive Paula Venels has been stripped of her CVE by the King following the Horizon IT scandal. She was heavily criticised for routinely denying any problems with the system, which led to the wrongful prosecution of hundreds of sub-postmasters. She received the honour in 2018 and announced that she planned to hand it back with immediate effect last month. She'll now formally lose the title for bringing the honours system into disrepute. Well, police have confirmed that three children whose bodies were found at a home in Bristol died from knife injuries. Seven-year-old Faraz Bash, three-year-old Jury and nine-month-old Mohammed were found dead in the Sea Mills area on Sunday. The 42-year-old woman arrested on suspicion of their murder remains in hospital and is being treated for non-life-threatening injuries. A vigil is due to be held later in memory of the children. Avon and Somerset Police Chief Inspector Vicky Haywood Mellon says officers are continuing to do all they can to establish the detail. The loss of such young children who have their whole lives ahead of them is truly heartbreaking. And our thoughts remain with the family and everyone affected by this tragedy. Our investigation, led by the Major Crime Investigation Team, is progressing at pace. And we're carrying out comprehensive inquiries to establish the events that led to this devastating loss of life. ISIS bride Shamima Begum has lost an appeal over the removal of her British citizenship. The now 24-year-old was a teenager when she left the UK to travel to Syria and joined the so-called Islamic State. Her citizenship was later revoked on national security grounds, Begum's solicitor, Daniel Ferner, has promised to continue fighting until she is back home. We are going to keep fighting. I, I, I want to say that I'm, I'm sorry to Shamima and to her family that after five years of fighting, she still hasn't received justice in the British court. And to promise her and to promise the government that we're not going to stop fighting. An asylum seeker has been sentenced to nine years and six months for the manslaughter of four migrants who drowned trying to cross the channel. In a retrial at Canterbury Crown Court, Ibrahima Barr was found guilty of piloting an unseaworthy inflatable between France and the UK in December of 2022. He claimed smugglers threatened to kill him if he refused to drive the boat, but the prosecution said he owed the passengers a duty of care. The jury reached a majority verdict of 10 to 2 in what is believed to be the first conviction of its kind. Britain has signed a new deal with the EU's border agency in a further bid to stop small boat crossings. The agreement with Frontex will see UK border force cooperate more closely with its European counterparts on intelligence and training. 1,716 people have been intercepted crossing the channel illegally so far this year. James Cleverly says the deal will help tackle the problem. It means we can share information quicker, share intelligence quicker, we can operate more effectively. And the reason that's important is because the EU wants to secure its external borders just as we do. So people who are coming into Europe from uh, Eastern Europe, across the Mediterranean, the European Union wants to stop them. We want to help them stop them because those people filter through Europe and ultimately find themselves on small boats coming across the UK. Thousands of residents have been evacuated from their homes in Plymouth, where a World War II bomb was found in a garden in the Keyham area. Now, if you're watching on television, you can see live pictures from Torpoint Ferry, where the 500-kilogram unexploded device will be taken by military personnel, where it will be disposed of. Plymouth Council says the operation to remove the bomb was delayed due to efforts to ensure that the area was fully evacuated. 
They now anticipate that the cordon will be lifted at around 6.15pm this evening. They're urging residents not to return until they give them the all-clear. The biggest ever drug bust has been made by UK authorities in what's being called a major blow to drug cartels. 5.7 tonnes of cocaine with a street value of more than £450 million was found in a container at Southampton Port, which was transporting bananas from South America. National Crime Agency officers believe the haul was heading to Hamburg, but say a significant proportion of the drug would have ended up back in the UK. Cannabis has now been legalised in Germany. Chancellor Olaf Scholz's ruling three-party coalition voted to allow individuals to cultivate three plants and be in possession of up to 25 grams of the drug. Larger-scale production will also be allowed for members of cannabis clubs. It's hoped that the change will help to crack down on the black market and drug-related crime in the country. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now back to Martin. Now, we start with some breaking news this hour and a body recovered from the River Thames on Monday has been formally identified as Abdul Azidi. A post-mortem examination carried out on Wednesday confirmed his cause of death was drowning. Azidi was formally identified yesterday. He, of course, was the suspect in the hunt for the person who performed a chemical attack earlier this month. Just to quickly recap that, the body recovered from the River Thames on Monday has now been formally identified as Abdul Azidi. Of course, he was the suspect in the Clapham chemical attack. Now, moving on to comments with the, from the former Home Secretary, Suella Braverman. Sensational comments this morning in The Telegraph. She said that Islamists are now in charge of Britain. Ms Bradman made the claim just a couple of days after those infamous and horrendous protests outside Westminster on Wednesday night. A number of messages, including the words, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, were projected onto the Elizabeth Tower, which of course is home to the Big Ben Bell. Swella Bradman wrote in the Telegraph this morning, the truth is that the Islamists, the extremists and the anti-Semites are in charge now. They have bullied the Labour Party, they have bullied our institutions, and now they have bullied our country into submission. Well, earlier on in the show, I asked fellow GB News presenter Nigel Farage for his views on the unfolding anarchy taking hold of Britain's streets due to this rise of Islamic extremism. Depressing, upsetting, uh, but I'm afraid, from my perspective, entirely predictable. Uh, this is the direct result of irresponsible immigration policies from both Labour and Conservative governments over the course of the last 25 years. The encouragement of multiculturalism, the encouragement of identity politics, the encouragement of everybody having a label and everybody being separate, rather than us all being treated equally before the law. This is where we've got to, and I'm afraid, add to that a lack of moral courage and leadership coming from government, coming from the Church of England. We've forgotten who we are. We've forgotten what we are. We are a very tolerant country. We believe in freedom of religious expression. Of course we do. But here's the point. Everything we believe in, everything we've built over the last thousand years and more is based on family, nation, and underpinning all of it our Judeo-Christian principles. I mean, they're right through our constitutional settlement and everything else. And we've forgotten that. We're afraid to stand up for that. And now it's that that is being crushed. And to see fear stalking the corridors of Westminster in the way that it is, is, is a deep international humiliation for our nation. Well, strong words there from Nigel Farage, who's in the USA, and that's his show will be live from there tonight. But I'm joined in the studio now by our political editor, Christopher <laughs> Hope. Chris, let's talk about those words that were broadcast around the world from the river to the sea on 
Big Ben and in particular the projection and on GB News we got in there I filmed it I put it out and I was asking police on the ground why aren't you stopping this what is stopping you from doing it today Chris it seems number 10 agree with us yeah, number 10 have been reacting to what you, what you were showing on your on your social media channels and we've been broadcasting here on GB News. They've been very clear that in number 10's view, in the Prime Minister's view, according to the, the PM's deputy official spokesman, uh, while they won't get involved in operational policing, it was wrong to allow that to be broadcast onto Big Ben. Now, the timing was all. Don't forget, that was around 6pm, I believe, on Wednesday night. Within the hour, MPs were due to be voting on measures which should have been immediate ceasefire, a humanitarian pause, a, um, a, media, a, a, a immediate ceasefire, full stop, in, in, um, in, uh, in Gaza. And so the fact that that was being broadcast onto the building where MPs are voting, almost, almost it's a, a physical demonstration of the pressure being put on MPs and almost might explain why Lindsay Hoyle, of course, earlier had said, well, I'm going to let Labour MP vote for their policy rather than increase pressure on them. But there's no question there's big concern here. And you, the remarks there from Sarah Braveman are very punchy, but it has kicked off the row with um, uh, um, uh, um, the um, mayor of uh, London being very concerned. He's likening it to a remark saying that it's almost like Enoch Powell. And that, that, that of course, is a divisive Tory politician from the past who, whose remarks about the rivers of blood did a lot to worsen race relations. I mean, this language shows how tense we are over this whole area. Why is Sadiq Khan saying things like that when he is the de facto police and crime commissioner of London. On his watch on Wednesday night, the old bill stood around and did nothing. They let this carry on. They didn't arrest anybody. As I saw in my footage, I was pointing out personally, me, that guy's wearing a face mask. That's illegal. You've got the powers to arrest him. You, go and get him. The police just looked the other way. When I said, there's the projector over the yeah, green. It's about Here's the size the... of this mug, wasn't it? It was yeah, very small. It was portable, tiny. It, and I walked up to it. I filmed it close up. I went, mate, I walked back over the green. I showed the police officer. I said, look, it's there. You can see the light. Go and switch it off. They didn't do anything. Were they not clear on the on the laws on the ground? No, they we, said to, they said did to they me. Know, is it, did they know it was broken law? Because the point of the number 10 is saying we can't get involved, and nor should we possibly, in operational policing, but they're saying it's wrong it was allowed to happen. So d d d is it down to p police chiefs, and therefore Sadiq Khan, who, of course, is the overall in charge of the Met policing, to tell officers to enforce the law and ensure that Jews uh, and people from Israel feel safe. That language there is about sweeping away Israel, removing the state of Israel, broadcasting onto Big Ben. That is offensive to Israel, clearly, and the Jews living here. Well, I told the copper in person, in 2016, laws were passed prohibiting parliamentary buildings being used for broadcasts. Um, and the law you need planning to do that. There it is. Unauthorised projections of parliamentary buildings. Anybody can Google this stuff. Why the old bill don't know this, and I do? Why, <laughs> why is again. my opera operational knowledge of the law better than the coppers... I mean, you could have thrown a towel over, over, the, over the projector and just dealt yeah. with it that way, but you didn't, of course. You wouldn't do that. But, I mean... Well, I wanted to do more than that. Um, mm. I wanted, I wanted to, to destroy that camera, but if I'd have done that, I'd have been the one getting nicked. You can't do that, Martin. So I didn't do that. Property. Of course you can't do that. But why didn't the police step in? It's an operational matter. And that's it. And they didn't do that. And, and this is the problem. The problem is, on the ground, in the media, in the country, people feel we have two-tier policing now, Chris. Do number 10 get this? Are they waking up to it? Op-eds in the Telegraph are one thing, but what about some concrete blooming action? The problem that number 10 have got, and all politicians have, is that the police are operationally independent. We don't have a politicised police force. It's up to them how they apply laws. They may have felt at the time, we're, they're not here to explain themselves, that had they stepped in and removed that camera, covered it up, uh, pu pushed it to the ground, or whatever happened to it, that may have been uh, uh, inflamed uh, and caused more problems than it was, wasn't caused, caused, causing. No one was being hurt by the images on, on Parliament, despite how, how Jews may have felt about it. They may have felt it may have inflamed a delicate situation. We don't know the answer to that question, but politicians can't get involved in that, Martin. OK, well, let's go now to the former deputy chair of the Conservative Party, Lee Anderson, of course, MP for Ashfield. Lee, you no doubt heard that conversation there. People are absolutely furious in, 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 the, in the views we're getting in today, Lee. Here's a typical comment from Audrey after the scenes on Wednesday outside Parliament and inside. Martin, I don't recognise our once great country anymore. Joanne says this. Martin, this country will never recover its identity. It's about time we sent the army in to sort this mess out on our streets. Shocking, Martin. I mean, I was there, as you know, on, on Wednesday night. We could hear the commotion outside, and this is down to... We've got a very cowardly con 
uh, run in London. He's uh, he seems to be letting the uh, not only the Jewish population down, but the whole population of London and Britain as a whole. And I heard the comments here. I heard the comments earlier you was making about Suella. Some of the comments she made earlier this week, and I don't actually believe that these Islamists have got control of our country. But what I do believe is they've got control of Khan and they've got control of London, and they've got control of Storm as well. And we've seen the shocking scenes played out in Parliament just a few nights back where Storm had crumbled. He put pressure on the Speaker to alter the rules, if you like, for the nature of the debate and the ultimate voting. And this is, this is a result of, of weak leadership. This is Starmer. I mean, I've got a little bit of sympathy for the Speaker. I did, I did sign the EDM, but this stems with Starmer and it stems with Khan. God forbid us, Martin. If Labour get in control at the next election, expect more of this across our great country. And what's the answer then, Lee? I mean, it got to the point where the aggro on the streets, and I was in the thick of it, I saw the police turning a blind eye to face coverings, to projectiles being thrown, and outside they were haranguing people inside, and they were holding up placards saying your grandchildren will need to know how you voted. Yeah. Is there a climate of fear inside Parliament, Lee? Are people voting now, not with their hearts, but through fear? Well, there, there is a climate of fear, Martin, obviously, and that, that's our own fault. That's all of our fault. It's the whole of Parliament. It's our job to, to actually run the country. Now, look, it's 40 years this, this year since the, uh, it's the anniversary of the miners' strike. And I was on some of the picket lines with my dad. I can remember my dad going to, to Orgreave, coming back a changed man. There was a different type of policing there, Martin. I'm not saying we should go back to that brutal sort of police, policing that I saw on the picket lines all those years ago. But I tell you what, we could do a, do with a little bit of that back now to control our streets because people are just turning up in their thousands and doing anything they want and they are laughing. They are laughing at our police and I feel absolutely disgusted. And again, this stems with Khan. He's, 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 he's actually given our, given our capital city away to his mates. We've got Starmer there, we're using Khan's pockets. He's doing nothing. He's more interested in getting into number 10 and giving our country away than actually looking after our country. And a, a special message here, Marty, is I'm get quite angry about this. Anybody who's thinking about voting for reform at the election who thinks this is going to sort out all our problems, look, beware. Because if you let Labour in through the back door, expect more of this and expect our cities to be taken over by these lunatics. But Lee Anderson, Chris Hope in the studio here, surely you're, you're confusing the two things there. There's policy, there's law being passed, but the police are of, and should be operationally independent. I mean, you can't blame Chris, choices Chris, made by the, the, the let police. Me, let, me, let, me, let me finish, Lee. You, you can't blame operational choices made by the police on the ground on politicians. The laws are there. There's a question about the, why the police didn't enforce them operationally, but you can't really divide, you bring those two into the same place because they're not. There's a separate issue here with how the police are, are applying laws passed by you in Parliament. Yes, no, I, I get that, uh, Chris, 100%. But, you know, ultimately, we, we run the country. And if the police aren't doing their job, and they're not doing the job, Chris, as you know, we need to step in and take over. You know, it's about time we scrap the mayor. But you can't, but you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, the politicians can't take over the policing. That well, is not well, how we are in this country. Well, Chris, go back to 1984... And look at what Maggie did and the Conservative government in 1984 when they ensured that the strike, that the, the, the working miners got to work in this country. There comes a time in this country where, where the whole of Parliament has got to make a stand and saying this is not good enough. There are people on our streets, our Jewish community, who are fret to death of going out because this nonsense we saw being shot onto Big Ben, the Elizabeth Tower, on Wednesday night. Something needs to happen. We can't just keep saying it's an operational matter. We've got to do something. But, 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 but your government brought in um, elected policing and crime commissioners. Yes. They do exist. Yes. You have got S Sadiq Khan. He's in charge. And I'd get rid of him uh, tomorrow, along, along, along with the Home Secretary. Now, today, James Cleverly, who's the Home Secretary, he said you've got to divide the operational powers of police uh, with, with policy. And, with, and if yeah. that, that is why we have trust in our police in this country. If you, do, if you mess with that, you're in real trouble, surely. Well, what trust is, is there, Chris, in the police, in the Metropolitan Police at the moment? We've seen scandal after scandal with the, with the uh, sexual um, cases coming to, to the fore. We're seeing this nonsense on our streets. We've seen it with the BLM riots. We're seeing it now uh, on Parliament Square on almost a weekly basis. Are you telling me there's trust there? Seriously? 
Well, so what are we going to do about it then, Lee? I mean, what do we just send, send in the batons like in 84? Well, I think the, the police need to take a different direction, Martin. Obviously, it's very, very difficult. Chris is right in, in one thing that he says. You know, ultimately, uh, Mayor Khan is, the, is, the, is in charge of the police. He's the police and crime commissioner, ultimately. You know, the people of London need to come to the census, I think, in May and get rid of him and restore some pride and some safety back onto the streets of London. OK, Lee Anderson, we have to leave it there. And, of course, Sadiq Khan isn't here to defend himself. A lot of pops were had at him there. Um, he would no doubt disagree with a lot of that. But thanks for joining us, Lee Anderson. Now, you've had your Weetabix. Superb stuff. Now, you get lots more on that story on our website. And thanks to YouTubeNews.com. It's the fastest-growing national news website in the country. It's got breaking news and all of the brilliant analysis that you've come to expect from GB News. And let's bring some breaking news now. Just came in to Chris Hope. Former Tory MP Bob Stewart has had his conviction for a racially aggravated public order offence quashed at Southwark Crown Court. And Mr Stewart told Syed Ahmed Al-Wadi to go back to Bahrain in December 2022. Mr Stewart was convicted last November for a racially aggravated public order offence in relation to that incident. He denied that his comments were racist. Instead, he claimed that he simply meant to tell Al-Wadi that he could protest safely if he were to return to Bahrain. So he's been cleared of that offence. Now, Shamima Begum's lost her latest bid to challenge the removal of her British citizenship. Well, when's she going to get the message that maybe we simply don't want her back here? I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, we're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Lee Anderson's Real World. Fridays from 7 p.m. Dr. Jane Jones, it was the clinical lead for Care After Combat. Yep. Jane, thanks for coming. And uh, just tell me a little bit about your organisation. What do you do? OK, well, thank you for having me here so we can talk about Care After Combat. So we are an organisation, a charity, who work into the prison system, working with military veterans who've somehow got involved with the justice system and... So there's, there's quite a high population of, of ex-service men and women in our prisons. Why is that, do you think? So 2014, the government did a review of who was resident in UK prisons and what they found were that military veterans are the highest occupational group. And this obviously raises some concerns. Yeah. So the government wanted to do something about that. And so they supported Care After Combat initially, just as a scoping exercise, really, to see if there was any way we could help these men and women actually, you know, understand the problems that led to offending behaviour yeah. and go on to lead successful lives. So what sort of offending behaviour are we talking typically for the people that's in prison that's actually served in our armed forces? Primarily it's uh, violence. Yeah. So that is the highest offence that, that we work with. Okay. But of course the military, as with everybody else, it's the full range of offending behaviour. OK, so we're in a pub, Jane. Dr. Jane, uh, and I guess for some people, you know, the old tip of alcohol is good, uh, yeah. a bit of fun uh, of a weekend, relax, let your hair down, but for some people, alcohol is not always their best friend, and I guess that plays a, plays a part in some of your veterans that end up inside. Yeah. Absolutely. So, speaking from my own experience, a good two-thirds of the people I work with have some kind of mental health problem or mental health yeah. difficulty, struggling to either adapt into yep. civilian life or with some of the traumas they've experienced during service. People might self-medicate with alcohol to manage some of those thoughts and feelings. Yeah. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Carson, this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the Clown Show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel.
News. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Welcome back, 526. Now, viewers on GB News can see live pictures on screen from Plymouth. An unexploded World War II bomb was found in a garden on Tuesday, and they're about to dispose of the bomb in the sea. And when the bomb goes bang, we'll make sure we cut back to show you that moment. Now, Shamima Begum has lost her latest bid to overturn the decision to strip her of her British citizenship. Begum travelled to Syria in 2015, aged 15, and her citizenship was revoked on national security grounds shortly after she was found in a Syrian refugee camp back in 2019. Well, to discuss this ongoing saga, I'm now joined by the immigration barrister, Paul Turner. Paul, welcome to the show. So, another court appearance, another loss for Shamima Begum. How long can this charade keep on rolling on? Well, Martin, thank you for having me on. Um, I think perhaps we, uh, Shamima may have come to the end of these particular proceedings. I say that because the um, Court of Appeal uh, rejected her appeal and all three judges agreed that the appeal could not succeed. In short, the Court of Appeal had to decide whether the uh, earlier uh, tribunal, SIAC, the Special Immigration Appeals Commission, had made an error of law in their approach. The Court of Appeal were not re-deciding the case uh, anew or afresh. They were just seeing whether the decision contained any error of law. Now, given that three Court of Appeal judges have rejected the legal argument and found that there was uh, no arguable error of law or approach taken by the uh, un the uh, previous tribunal, it seems to me that getting to the Supreme Court and taking this matter further is going to be exceptionally difficult for her. And, Paul, it's worth bearing in mind an extortionate amount of taxpayers' money has been spent on this. By my reckoning, it's £4 million and rising in legal aid. Surely there's a justifiable reason now to call time on this money. Well, uh, it's news to me that it's £4 million, and that is an enormous sum of money that perhaps could have been spent on other matters. Um, there is something that is worth saying, which is... When one reads the Court of Appeal decision, one sees a couple of factors which, which make this case rather sad. Um, I'm not saying the decision is wrong. Firstly, the, the Court of Appeal recorded that there was credible evidence that she was a victim of trafficking for sexual purposes. And secondly, the court found that there was a, a, at least an arguable case that the uh, police, uh, social services and the local authority, school rather, and the local authority had failed in, in their duties to prevent this sort of thing happening. So one has some sympathy for her, perhaps at the very beginning, um, where the state failed her. However, having said that, it is a large sum of money, and I would struggle to see how the lawyers could justify any more public funding to take this matter to the Supreme Court, given what is a, a, a quite an emphatic loss um, in the Court of Appeal. Do you think that situation, Paul, could change in the future if we have a change of government, for example, and Sir Keir Starmer gets in, for example, um, a few years ago, he said he thought that revoking Begum's citizenship was the wrong decision? Well, uh, Mr Starmer has a, a recent track record of changing his mind on, on various things. Um, some people would say to, to see the way the wind's blowing. Um, I think it would be very unpopular if the law was changed in respect of one individual. And it has to be remembered that the um, Court of Appeal found that there was nothing wrong in the assessment that she was uh, a security risk to the British public. So people might well justifiably find that um, excluding somebody by way of depriving them of their nationality for someone that poses a risk to British society is entirely justified. And I query whether the uh, whether if Keir Starmer is forming a government, he would um, invite what is clearly going to be a, a huge amount of adverse publicity for the sake of bringing back one individual um, whom it has never really been suggested is not a threat to the United Kingdom. 
it seems to be uh, the her case is predicated, and I can understand why on the basis that there was a, a there is a case that she was trafficked. Um, but uh, uh, would a government, if I was in a government as a, a lawyer, would I think that this is worth a candle? No. OK, Paul Turner, thank you for your advice. And it's worth pointing out that if we were to get Begum back in the country, it would be a thick end of a quarter of a million pounds per year, every year, to house her in a high-security jail. And if you were ever released, then there'd be a huge amount of money in benefits and full-time security going out. For now, that's not going to happen. Now, there's lots more still to come between now and six o'clock. Sir Keir Starmer is expected to be our Prime Minister this time next year. Well, I'm going to discuss the claim that the closer he gets to power, the more he seems to behave like Jeremy Corbyn. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Ray Addison. Thanks, Martin. It's 5.31, our top stories. Former Tory MP Bob Stewart has had his racially aggravated public order conviction quashed at Southwark Crown Court. Mr Stewart was convicted last November after he was accused of telling an activist to go back to Bahrain during a row outside the Foreign Office. Now, that is a breaking story. We'll bring you more on that as we get it. The body recovered from the River Thames has been formally identified as suspected chemical attacker Abdul Zaidi. On Wednesday, a post-mortem confirmed the cause of his death was drowning. Met Police says it's still been unable to talk to a 31-year-old woman injured in the attack. Former Post Office Chief Executive Paula Bennells has been stripped of her CVE by the King following the Horizon IT scandal. She was heavily criticised for routinely denying any problems with the system, which led to the wrongful prosecution of hundreds of postmasters, uh, sub-postmasters. She'll formally lose the title for bringing the honours system into disrepute. An asylum seeker has been sentenced to nine years and six months for the manslaughter of four migrants who drowned trying to cross the channel. Ibrahim Abar was found guilty of piloting an unseaworthy inflatable between France and the UK in December 2022. He claimed that smugglers threatened to kill him if he refused to drive the boat, but the prosecution said that he owed the passengers a duty of care. ISIS bride Shemaima Begum has lost an appeal over the removal of her British citizenship. The now 24-year-old was a teenager when she left the UK to travel to Syria and joined the so-called Islamic State. Her citizenship was later revoked on national security grounds. Begum's solicitor has vowed to continue fighting until she returns home. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Let's take a look at the markets. The pound will buy you $1.2679 and 1.1711 euros. Price of gold, £1,607.55 per ounce. And the FTSE 100s closed now at 7,706 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Ray. Now, so many of you got in touch today to give your views on Swella Braverman's claim that Islamists are in charge of Britain. And before the end of the show, I want to read out some of those emails. They're astonishingly frank. You'll enjoy them. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, we're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Carson, this Saturday night showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday night showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News Breakfast. 
every day from 6am. Lots of people very concerned about what's happening in the Middle East. Iran obviously denying it, but the next move from the United States, of our key allies, will be absolutely key. Absolutely right. And I think um, there's a lot of talk about where this could go, whether the situation could be escalated. But I think the, the chatter um, is heading in the right direction, which is about de-escalation. So uh, if there are going to be uh, uh, targeted um, uh, sanctions against Iran, that's already happened through expelling uh, uh, certain diplomats and, 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 other, and other measures there. But uh, you can do that without... Uh, arm-to-arm uh, -arm combat uh, at this stage. But um, I think the US will be weighing up all of its options. Um, Anthony Blinken obviously gave a press conference in the United States yesterday to say that, you know, there will be a response from the US, but it'll be at their time and it'll be uh, in the way in which they think is the most appropriate. So um, all eyes are now uh, on the United States as to when it makes that move. Yeah, and it's fascinating, isn't it, how domestic politics plays so much into international politics. The states, they've got a presidential election this year. Uh, we've got a budget coming up. So all the noise, both sides, you've got Donald Trump saying, you know, go a bit more hawkish, I suppose you could say, that, mm. than President Biden. And here we've got all the generals, we've got the Secretary of State for Defence coming out saying, we need conscription, we need more <laughs> cash. Um, but a lot of that is, is, you know, part of the sort of national narratives rather than actually looking at what's happening in Iran, isn't it? It, it is. I mean, it plays into, you know, the, the very uncertain times that we're living. And, you, and you're absolutely right. You know, it, there'll be uh, a supporters of Donald Trump who um, are clearly adversaries of uh, Joe Biden to say we must act now. It's a demonstration of showing your strength. It, you know, um, uh, opponents of Biden will say that the US looks weak if it doesn't take uh, action now against uh, Iran, who are clearly, as we know, funding um, these uh, uh, arms length organizations like Hezbollah in Tehran, uh, like the Houthis who are carrying out the attacks in the Red Sea. So Iran is responsible. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. So join me, Tom Harwood, next Thursday for the Rochdale by-election results. From midnight through to 6 a.m., we'll discover the twists and turns of the most unpredictable by-election in a long time. You're not a big fan. You should be celebrating. I mean, it's left here again, you know. <laughs> we'll be there for every second of it, right through from midnight. Next Thursday on GB News, Britain's election channel. Welcome back. It's 5.38. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, stand by for a corking GB News exclusive on one of my favourite topics, the European Court of Human Rights. But before that, we've had hundreds and hundreds of emails today. It's fair to say Suella Bravman and the scenes in Wednesday at Parliament have really, really got you going. Let's start with this one on Suella Braverman. Stephen says this, Suella is correct. The Islamists are now in charge. They do what they want with impunity. The police and our councils are frightened of them. Muriel said this regarding the scenes at Parliament outside there on Wednesday when I was egged and, and harangued. She says, I think it's time to bring the army in to restore order on our streets. This is very, very serious and worrying. But Muriel, the army now seem more concerned with gender targets and diversity. So would that even work? Paul, as this, well said, here, here, Soella, the, pre the police are a total disgrace. And Susan quickly says this, the hate message on Big Ben was an insult and a disgrace to our country. These demonstrations on Saturdays have become nothing more than civil disobedience. It is time to ban them. Now my favourite part of the week. It's Friday afternoon and it wouldn't be complete without a quick nibble of Michelle Jubri. Michelle, Jubes and Co coming oh, up. Oh, I miss it. It's a quick nibble on me. It's my <laughs> pre-watershed, Martin. Goodness gracious me, everybody. You need to go for a lay down at this rate, won't we? Uh, anyway, what have I got coming up on my programme? Uh, well, of course, I want to ca carry on that conversation about Suella Braveman. Uh, my panel have very different opinions on that. Uh, indeed, I've heard you talk about this as well, Suella. 
um, oh, what's her name, Shamima Begum. How could I possibly forget her name? Anyway, good is what I say, that she's not coming back to this country. One of my panel say, well, she's only 15, she was groomed and all the rest of it. Pull the other one, where are your, where are your thoughts on that at home? Also, as well, abortion. Uh, parliamentarians look set to debate whether or not it should be legalised post 24 weeks goodness gracious me so i want to get stuck into all of that and also drugs has been a massive drug heist um, in this country some people are saying look at all the quantity of drugs that was seized is it time to legalize uh, drugs now and actually see it as a revenue stream for the treasury oh uh, what do people make to that well that's a superb menu as ever jubes and co 6 to 7 p.m straight after this don't miss it thank you now, we've said a lot about the dramatic events of Wednesday when Sir Keir Stormer allegedly put pressure on Speaker Sir Lindsay Hoyle. Sir Keir, of course, has strenuously denied that allegation. But one writer claimed today that the closer Sir Keir gets to power, the more he seems to behave like his predecessor, Jeremy Corbyn. And that's according to Fred de Fossard, who works at the Legatum Institute. The Legatum Institute is owned by the Legatum Group, and the group is also one of the lead investors in the holding company of GB News. So let's discuss this topic further now with the political commentator, Joe Phillips. Joe, so there's a feeling emerged this week that when push came to shove, Sakir appeared to lean on the speaker and the return of sectarian politics, some are saying, particularly around the Middle East, seems to feel like the bad old days. What's your take? Well, he has said quite clearly, um, Sakir Starmer, that he did go to see um, the speaker, Sir Lindsay Hoyle. He has denied, um, and I have no reason to disbelieve him, uh, that he made any threats, although I'm surprised that um, The Telegraph published um, that article, which claims with no substantiation that the speaker was threatened by um, Sir Keir Starmer. I mean, I think, you know, as your listeners and viewers have just been saying, Martin, the scenes in Parliament were an absolute disgrace. And apart from the fact that, you know, votes in Westminster are not going to make much impact on the poor people of Gaza or Israel, um, to see all the parties behaving so badly um, and throwing their toys out of the pram was absolutely shameful. And I think it shames our parliamentary system. So I don't think that Keir Starmer um, can take the blame for this. I think Leslie, um, Lindsay Hoyle has very clearly and very movingly apologised for what was clearly a mistake. I think he probably genuinely was trying to do the right thing. But you sort of wonder why, as it's so fractious and people have such strong views on this particular issue of the Middle East, why the three, four parties didn't get together um, and say, let's have a free vote on this, uh, let people vote according to their conscience. Um, I mean, you know, and if you can say that that is um, call, uh, Starmer becoming closer to Corbyn, I, I don't quite see where that's going because, I mean, he's actually bent over backwards to get rid of the anti-Semitism that was rife in the Labour Party. Don't forget, Martin, Jeremy Corbyn has never apologised and he's never taken any responsibility, even though he was found guilty um, by um, the Equalities and, and Human Rights Court. OK, Joe Phillips, we're going to have to leave it there. As you say, Corbyn might be gone, but the Palestine problem seems to be an omnipresent backdrop of the Labour Party to this day. Now, moving on, GB News can reveal that half of the judges, half of the judges currently serving on the European Court of Human Rights have never held similar positions in the past. You couldn't make it up. I'm Martin Dordney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Patrick Christie's Tonight, weekdays from 9pm. Mike Freer joins me now. Mike, thank you very much for coming well, into the studio. Thank you for inviting me. Um, firstly, how are you? 
It's been a busy day and uh, it's been a quite a traumatic experience. It's a, it's a real wrench to walk away from a job that you love, but also a constituency that um, you've become, you know, I live there, it's my home, and I regard many of my constituents as friends, and um, it is an amazing, amazing place, and to walk away from that um, is really quite, uh, it's quite an emotional um, wrench to think this was a job I loved, and, but unfortunately I can't do it anymore. Can you talk me through the process? Because you mentioned about the you know, alleged arson attack, etc., being the final straw, mm. but this has been a really quite a vile journey to get to this point. So what kind of threats have you had? What's that look like? Well, like every MP, I mean, you, you, day in, day out, you get abusive emails, you get low-level stuff that... Whether we should accept it, but we do, it's graffiti, you know, it's um, things like, you know, I've had, in the past I've had a mock Molotov cocktail left on the office door, meaning we had to evacuate the whole building. I've come out, and, out of my house and found, a, a, you know, a note on my car. Um, where I live is common knowledge, but what I drive is less so. And it's a few weeks after uh, John Mann had had the wound nuts on his car tampered with. So that all kind of makes you, you know, what on earth's going on. But I, I've had two run-ins with the organisation that was Muslims Against Crusades and people like Anjum Chowdhury, um, who was behind that organisation, um, been to prison. But Online, it said, I, I used to do surgery mo in mosques, uh, surgery mosques, so I wanted to go yeah. out and see people. And online, there's a picture of me saying, you're not welcome in our, uh, our mosque, let Stephen Timms be appointed reminder. So it's not very subtle. Well, just for our viewers and listeners who might not remember that. Stephen that Timms, mean? of course, was stabbed um, by a woman who'd been radicalised. Um, thank heavens he survived. So it was a very unsubtle. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's coming up to 5.48. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. And it's time now for a cracking GB News exclusive because we found out that exactly half of the 46 judges dictating to Britain in the European Courts of Human Rights have never held adjudicating positions in the past. That's right. They're not even lawyers. Well, joining me now to discuss this is the Conservative MP for Raleigh and Wickford, Mark Francois. Mark, welcome to the show. Mark, astonishing, absolutely astonishing. The people dictating law to the ECHR aren't even lawyers. Some of us have been arguing for a long time, Martin, that the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg is fundamentally different from the courts that we think of in our country back in the United Kingdom. People instinctively expect their courts to be objective and to operate on the basis of the evidence that is presented to them. The European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg is an intensely political court. It's not an objective court in the way we think of a court in Britain. It takes highly political decisions, most controversially recently about issues of immigration and asylum. And your figures, which are shocking, your word is aptly used, demonstrate in very ordinary English just how different this court is from courts in Britain. Yeah, and Mark, um, a cracking exclusive by Keith Bayes, my colleague. 11 of them, so 25%, haven't served as a judge or a lawyer. So <laughs> these people aren't qualified to do the job. So the big question next has to be, Mark, is it time finally for a referendum to leave the ECHR? Well, the court is, I will answer your question, the court is overreaching. Because it's a political institution, it tends to stick its nose in where it isn't welcome. So if you think a few years ago they tried to, take, uh, to insist that prisoners 
in jail should still be allowed to have the vote. And to his credit, the then Prime Minister, David Cameron, just said very simply, this is none of your business. We're going to ignore you. And effectively, we did. And in the end, in a desperate attempt to kind of maintain some sort of authority, the Strasbourg court backed down. But we should do this more often. We should have done this before we had all these rows on the Rwanda. We should have just said to the court, this is not your business. You are overreaching. You are interfering. You are overtly political. We're not accepting your jurisdiction here. Now, there are many other countries in Europe that now have this problem. Look at Maloney and the Italians. Look mm. at the immigration problems in Germany. So you're in a situation now where a number of other European countries are talking about wanting to renegotiate the European Convention on Human Rights. I think we should give that a go. But if that does not work, just as we tried to renegotiate our membership of the EU, you remember Cameron did that, it didn't really succeed. We ended up having a referendum and we decided peacefully and democratically to leave the EU. So my my short answer to your question is, we should now, I would like to see in the Conservative Manifesto, a commitment to renegotiate the European Convention on Human Rights and the role of the court. But if that does not succeed, then I believe we should leave. I hope, I mean, I've given some context to that answer, but I hope that's a clear answer. And I think you would be surprised, even members, of the One Nation group from a different tradition in the Conservative Party, many of those people would at least support the idea of renegotiating. So I think you would find across the Conservative Party there's a lot more consensus on that than some people might expect, which means it's not inconceivable we could put that in a manifesto, in which case I think it would be really popular. Yeah, no doubt a lot of people watching this show would conquer. Thank you so much for joining us, Mark Francois, on this Friday Thank afternoon. You. And surely, I, I agree with, with Mark there, surely the answer, we don't even need to leave this convention. Just just tell them what's the equivalent of up yours, Delors, as they used to do. Georgia Maloney, now they're still in it. Well, they've declared a state of emergency. They've done offshore containment of immigrants in Albania. They've gone around the court. We don't need to even listen to these people. Anyway, that's a separate conversation. I want to get to a few of your emails. We've had hundreds and hundreds of emails today on the topic of Islamism taking over our streets. Swella Bravman, of course, put those comments out. Um, here's one from Alan. Alan says this, Martin, I, you are 100% right and I support you. So do all the decent people. I applaud your bravery. It's about time someone stood up to this mob. Alan, of course, is talking about going out there and filming the mob on Wednesday, giving the evidence to the police. And number 10, to follow GB News' lead. They watch this channel. They're listening to the people. They're listening to you, the viewer. When you write in in your droves and say, sort the streets out, sort this mess out, Number 10 are listening, and we make sure that we give you, the great British public, a voice on that matter. Audrey says this, Martin, I don't recognise our once great country anymore. Joanne says this, Martin, this country will never recover its identity. We need to send the army in to sort out the mess on our streets. Peter says this, the police are afraid to arrest these people, so no matter how many laws are passed, the police will still do nothing. Paul says this, well said, Suella, the police are a disgrace. Carol, I'm not even Jewish, and this was extremely offensive to me, disgraceful to treat the the peaceful Jewish people like this. James adds this, a vote for Labour is a vote for no order all over our streets. Joyce, yes, it's not just Jews have been offended. I am a Christian and I find this deeply a offensive. That's it. Thank you very much for joining me this week. Um, I'll be here three till six next week. Thank you so much for your comments. It means the world to me. Stick around, because after this, it's Michelle Jubry with Jubes & Co. But until then, have a fantastic Friday and a peaceful weekend. Thank you very much. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News.
Good afternoon, welcome to your latest GB News weather update with me, Annie, from the Met Office. There'll be further showers through the rest of the day, some sunny spells too, but for all of us, it is feeling cooler than of late. That's as we've got a colder air mass upon us. It's much colder than we've seen through the rest of the beginning of February. We've got a westerly wind as well. That's been pushing in showers mainly to western areas so far today, but they will push into the east through the evening. So it will be a slightly damp evening across parts of the southeast. Further west, though, and north, it should turn a little dry drier as the night progresses and for many areas it will be dry by the morning however it's going to be much colder than recently tomorrow morning we'll likely see a frost quite widely also a risk of ice where we have seen any showers there's potential for some mist and fog to develop as well that could be slow to clear across central areas through Saturday morning but away from that it should be dry and bright to start the day cloud will bubble up as the day progresses though and we will see a risk of showers through the afternoon however the showers will be lighter and fewer than on Friday. So you've got a less of a chance of seeing them. And in any sunshine, it won't feel too bad. Highs of around nine or 10 degrees in the south. There'll be another cold start to the day on Sunday, but we will see some more persistent rain spreading in across the south. There is some uncertainty in exactly the details of how widespread that will be across the south. However, it does look like it will clear into Monday to give us a fine start to the new week, but further rain will arrive in the north on Tuesday that warm feeling inside from boxed boilers sponsors of weather on gb news i'm christopher hope and i'm gloria de piero bringing you pmq's live here on gb news every wednesday we'll bring you live coverage of prime minister's questions when rishi sunak and sir keir starmer go head to head in the house of commons we'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the prime minister and we'll put that to our panel of top